Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to day five of the MFS Summer School 2022. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to day five of the MFS Summer School. Sorry for that, I had to mute the other screen. Um, we're very happy today to have uh, Laura Veltkamp. Laura is a professor of finance at Columbia University. Uh, she's also a board member of the Macro Finance Society and a, 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 a long-term friend of the group. Um, so we're very happy to have her for the last day of our summer school. Um, Laura is going to be talking today about valuing data as an asset. Laura, uh, we're going to do um, uh, two breaks, one um, about an hour spaced apart. And just like we've been doing all week, everyone, please uh, type your questions in the chat and uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask them um, as we go along. We'll be taking occasional kind of pauses for questions. Um, and so please type them in. You can also use the raise hand feature as well. Thank you very much. Laura, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alexei. Thanks for inviting me to be here. Thanks everyone for coming to learn about uh, data as an asset. Let me get my screen up and running. Okay, it should be full screen. Good. Okay, so uh, today's class is on data economics and valuing data as an asset. Uh, this is based on joint work with a whole host of fabulous co-authors, including Simona Abis, Juliana Beganow, Nina Boyarchenko, Cindy, Cindy Chung, Jan Eckhout, Mariam Farbudi, David Luca, Adrian Matre, Roxana Mihet, Thomas Philippon, Dhruv Singhal, and Venki Venkateshwaran. Okay, so we're going to start out by talking about some tools to model the data economy. So the economy is changing, right? Most of the tools that we have to think about macro and finance are really industrial era tools. Think about it. We've got models where capital, physical capital, like machines and factories combined with labor to produce these rival goods and services we could call widgets. I don't know many people who work in an economy that looks like that. Most of the people that I know work with data, work with computers, generate knowledge. And in fact, in the economy, the largest firms in the economy are valued primarily for their data, right? What are the most valuable firms in the world? They're Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple. These firms are not valued for their buildings. I mean, sure, their buildings are valuable, but that's not where the bulk of their valuation comes from. So we've got these really valuable firms valuable assets, productive producers uh, that are valued primarily for their data. And we want to think about an economy that looks like that and ask, how do, how do the economics change? How do the valuations change? Is data just a new form of capital? Are we, you know, can we just lump it in with K just like we do machines? Or is there something fundamentally different about it? And there are a lot of challenges in this world. So one challenge is that economic activity generates informative data, right? If you think about where does data come from, we don't take some amount of GDP and output and convert it into data, like we might think about investing into a capital stock. Instead, we get data by seeing what happens. How many shirts does Alexei buy? How many socks does Arnab buy? How many uh, you know, books does Xiaoming buy? And what else did they buy with that? And what was their zip code? And how did they pay? Or traffic patterns or all kinds of search uh, uh, histories. So this means that economic activity is generating these things as a byproduct. That's a very different form of production for data than we have for capital. And in a way, it makes production a form of active experimentation. So active experimentation is where you take actions having in mind the value of the information that those actions will generate. So if a firm is producing apps and giving them away for free in order to generate the data that's likely to be a byproduct of you using their app, that's a form of active experimentation. And active experimentation models have been around for a few decades. People like Bergamon and Valimaki have worked on these. They're very difficult, right? These are not easy theories to work with. So one of the questions we'll rest with, wrestle with is how do we value information that may be generated as a byproduct of economic activity intentionally and is valuable for multiple periods, right? It's a long-lived asset. We don't think of Google as having data 
today and then it evaporates tomorrow, there's some persistent value of that data. So this is gonna require dynamic programming with information as a state variable. So that's something that's, that's new and we have to work out how to do that and how to do that tractably. We gotta think about data depreciation. If we wanna value data as an asset, we gotta think about how quickly does it lose value? Do we apply a standard like 12% annual discount factor to it? Sort of like maintenance on a building? Well, you know, maybe not. Maybe it depends on how the economy is changing. Maybe it depends on the context. Maybe it depends on economic fluctuations. So we'll look into that. And then lastly, this is different. This is not just a new capital because data is a non-rival good. Right? Rivalry means if I'm using it, you can't. If I'm working on my computer, you can't also do something different on my computer. If I'm using a, you know, a pencil, oh, can I make that appear? Uh, you can't also use the same pencil at the same time. Those are rival goods, but I can use a data set and you could use the same data set, a different copy of it, but you can use the same data at the same time for a different purpose and we will not interfere with each other's use of it. Now, it is true that if this is data, like in a competitive setting about demand for products or so forth, your use of it might reduce my value of that data. Okay, so the value might decline, but it is possible for us both to use the same data at the same time. It's a non-rival good, and that really makes its valuation and its economics substantially different from other assets we might think about accumulating. Okay, so we're gonna break this, this class into three parts, part one, is we'll talk about data used by firms. So we'll get more into the macroeconomics of it. We'll talk about first, what is data? And then a model that's a recursive framework that has these features where data is information, it's active experimentation, it's got long lived value, but we're gonna make this as tractable as a standard DSGE model. And I'll show you that they're both diminishing returns and increasing returns. We'll talk about efficiency, but also externalities. And then I'll introduce the idea of imperfect competition and market power, which are really central concerns in the realm of, of data economics. A lot of what regulators are interested in data economies for is how should we regulate them? And is there, a, is there sort of a natural tendency towards monopoly that might cause consumer losses? Then we'll break and we'll do part two. We'll talk about data and financial markets. We'll talk about data markets. Uh, we'll talk about data platforms and how they might be intermediating. We'll think about it sort of a new role for intermediaries, not as granting access to asset markets and not as monitoring or any of those other roles we think of financial intermediaries doing, but as acting like an information aggregator. So we'll think about a data platform as a, as a kind of financial intermediary that gathers information and shares it with various participants. And then we'll, we'll take another break and part three will be, okay, now let's take all these ideas about how the data economy is working, how data financial markets are working, and let's put it into some measurement ideas. So how do we do data measurement and data valuation? Laura, are you making a distinction between data and information? You're, you're kind of using both words, but is there a step where you kind of turn the data into information? Great, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about some of that. Um, Data is digitized information, but there's a distinction between raw data, processed data, and knowledge. So in the beginning of what I do, I'm going to think about it as if you get a piece of data, it's a signal, you know exactly what to make of it, you use Bayes' law and you figure out how to act optimally on it. In reality, there's a whole workforce of people who turn raw data into structured data. They're often called data managers, and there are thousands and thousands of them being hired every month. We can see that in the labor data, and I'll talk about those folks and how many there are and what they're getting paid and so forth. And there are a set of people who turn structured data into knowledge. You can think of those as analysts or consultants or, you know, where there are lots of, lot, we, know, you know, we know lots of those people, we train lots of those people. And so there are different layers of, of data between raw data and knowledge. I'm going to start by abstracting from that and then I'm going to come back because it turns out that breaking up those layers can be really useful for measurement. We can make a lot of useful inference about how much data a firm might have and how they value it by seeing how many of these kinds of workers they hire to work with the data or to process data and how much they pay them. Okay. Gotcha. Great question. So the data of interest is really big data. That's not all digitized information, right? Digitized information could include a score of music that's in a PDF or a, a poem saved as a, you know, as a word file. Um, 
that's not really what we're talking about. That's not usually what firms are using. Uh, they want big data sets to work with big data technologies, right? New machine learning and AI technologies or forecasting technologies that require massive data sets to be useful. Massive data sets are generated naturally by economic activity. So this could include this, and I mean economic activity broadly, not just transaction records, but search histories, you know, car traffic patterns, how many cars are in the parking lot of the target, um, but, you know, including things like your, your purchases and, and so forth. Um, and so all of this is used for, for forecasting, right? So keep in mind that AI and machine learning are forecasting tech, they're prediction technologies to be specific, right? That's what their nature is. So if we're thinking about data using, being used in conjunction with these new technologies, we really should think about data being used for prediction and forecasting. So this is how I want to think about data, digitized information generated by economic activity used for forecasting some random unknown state. And that makes data distinct from technology, from patents, and from learning by doing. So it's different from ideas and technologies, both we're going to think about as something that improves the productivity of a firm, but ideas and technology are really procedures, they're concepts. That's not what big data sets are about. We don't have massive amounts of procedures and concepts being spun off that we can analyze with these techno data hungry technologies. Data might be an input into technology. In fact, many of us use data as part of our research to generate new ideas, but it's not the same as an idea. It's also not the same as learning by doing. So what these two have in common is that learning by doing is also something that's generated as a byproduct of economic activity. You do, you produce, and then you learn. But theories of learning by doing are about how workers learn. When workers learn, that means we're adding to the human capital in their head, right? That's not something you can directly sell. I cannot sell you rights to knowledge that's in my head. I can teach you but that's an activity that requires labor and effort and so forth. So we can transfer human capital in ways, but we can't sell it directly on a data market. And it's owned by workers, right? What's in my head, I fundamentally have ownership over. In a so society with no slavery, I have full ownership of my human capital rights. Data is different, and we're going to think about firms as having rights over that data. Now, maybe in the future, we want to think about consumers having more rights over their data and potentially selling data rights to firms. But as of right now, if you do a transaction with a firm, at least in the US, they have a lot of leeway about what they can do and how they can monetize that. Okay, so it's related to these other ideas. Uh, it's related to technology. It's related by learning, by doing. We'll draw ideas, we'll draw you know, um, insights from both of those literatures, but it's not the same as either one. Okay. So that's sort of the nature of data. Now on to how data is generated. So most big data that firms use is transactions. It's browsing history. It's your GPS location. It's all kinds of information about what you're doing. I want to think about this cartoon from The New Yorker as sort of a metaphor for what's going on in lots of the data economy. Uh, these kids have a lemonade stand and the adults are saying, well, it's free, but they sell your information. So think about this for a minute. I mean, obviously kids aren't usually bartering lemonade for data, uh, you know, on the street corner these days, but there are lots of firms that do. I bet every one of you has a phone and on your phone is an app that you paid zero dollars for. Maybe it's a weather app, maybe it's a flashlight app, whatever. And somebody paid to generate that app, right? It wasn't free to develop. And they didn't do it out of the goodness of their heart. This isn't, you know, your flashlight app is not a charity. Why? What's the business model there? Well, the business model is that they give the app away for free in exchange for your data. Right? They're going to see, they're going to track some things that you do while you have that app running or maybe in the background, where you are, how often you turn it on, what else you're doing while you've got it while you've got this thing on, and they're going to monetize that data in, in some way. Lots and lots of firms are doing this. So there's a whole set of economic activity that we're not counting in GDP, right? That flashlight app, price times quantity, the price was zero. It's not getting counted. And even aside from the stuff that's truly free, that's obviously being bartered for, for data, there are a whole other set of transactions where 
maybe we're getting a data discount. So if you think about a firm that's starting up and it wants to sell products on its website, but it really wants to learn about its customers, that firm strategically, optimally, should set its price a little bit lower to generate lots of transactions, to generate a customer base, and to learn about their customers. Well, what does that really mean? How could we rephrase that? Well, that setting their price a little bit lower means that they're charging you partly a monetary fee for that good, but you're partly paying for that good or service with your data. That's a partial barter trade. I paid $5.99 for some sports equipment, but I also paid them with some customer data that maybe was worth 19 cents, right? So there's some monetary payment and there's some amount of barter trade. So not only are there pure barter trades out there where we're exchanging maybe digital apps for data, but there are a lot of partial barter trades out there. And this was made explicit when uh, Amazon started doing a discount at Whole Foods where if they could scan a QR code that would link your grocery purchases to your Amazon Prime account, they would give you 5% back on your grocery bill. That made explicit that you were paying 5% of your grocery bill with data. There was some monetary payment, the 95%, and some data barter trade, the 5%. Okay, so there's lots of activity in the economy right these days that looks like old-fashioned barter. Okay, so how do we think about this in terms of a model? Let's get right into the mechanics of it. I'm going to start by assuming a continuum of competitive firms. This is my least favorite assumption about this model. I'm going to hold my nose for now and I'm going to come back and relax it. Why do I do it? Well, because this is our first stab at writing a dynamic recursive economy with data and there were lots of other complications to wrestle with and perfect competition was a natural starting point. And for a lot of the questions I'm going to look at at the beginning probably doesn't make that big a difference, right? So for some questions, this is a fine benchmark to answer. But there are a lot of interesting questions about the data economy that we're going to want to relax perfect competition for, that we're going to want to think about. Are there superstar firms that naturally go, grow big and do they have competitive advantages and might that you know, affect uh, the, the profitability or the entry in this, uh, in this market? Okay, so for now, perfect competition. We'll revisit that in about 40 minutes. Each firm uses capital. KI for firm I, T at time T to produce K to the alpha units of goods. We could put labor in here also. Let's just try to keep it simple. Let's think about capital, physical capital, as being used to produce goods. But these goods have a quality AIT. And the quality is where the data is going to enter. Okay, so I'm going to do something that Tom Sargent told me never to do, which is to put an equilibrium object in the setup of the model. We can microfound it, but I want to cast the whole consumer demand side off to the side for now because it's not really very relevant for anything I'm going to do later. So I'm just going to tell you that aggregate output is a sum over all firms, quality and quantity. And that sum is really an integral because we've got an infinite number of firms. OK, so this is just total quality adjusted output. This is what we're going to call aggregate output and the equilibrium price in this economy I'm just going to assert this, okay? Well, we can come back and talk about microfounding it later, but the equilibrium price is a parameter P bar and a decreasing function of aggregate output. So the more firms produce, the lower is the equilibrium price. Basically, there exists a downward sloping demand curve. And I'm just going to postulate that because there's nothing interesting going on behind that curtain. Okay, what is interesting? What's interesting is where does quality come from? So each firm is going to have a technique and that technique, there's an optimal technique, but they don't know it. Okay. So their optimal technique is theta plus epsilon AIT. Theta, which is common to all firms, is an AR1 process. So it's persistent and it's got innovations, eta, their normal mean mu variant sigma theta. Here's our AR1 process, our mean, our persistence parameter and our normal innovations. That's the piece that they're going to use data to learn about. I'm going to try to figure out what's my optimal technique. But there's also this piece of technique that's unlearnable. Nothing will teach me about it. That may be a very small piece, but it's whatever stuff happens between when I'm learning and when I have got this technique outcome is going to realize that was just totally unpredictable. 
And we'll talk later about what role that, that plays in the model. So it's unlearnable and it's IID. It's independent across firms. It's independent across time. The cross firms part isn't so important. You just need it independent across time. If it were persistent, I'd want to roll it into part of the AR1 process. Okay, so then what's quality? Quality depends on a technique you're going to choose, AIT, and how far that technique is from this optimum, theta plus epsilon. Okay, so here's the distance. There's my choice, AIT, and here's the optimum, minus theta plus epsilon. And that distance squared. Right, because I don't want to think about negatives as being good or, you know, just how far you are. So it's a squared, it's a quadratic loss function. And then I'll have some decreasing function G of that quadratic error, if you want, that tracking error. Okay, why a decreasing function? Well, I want to think about accuracy as being good, right? The squared piece has a minimum of zero and everywhere else it's positive because it's a square. So if A is right on target, it's exactly the optimal action, this piece is at its minimum, and I want G, I want quality to be at its maximum, okay? So G should be a monotonically decreasing function. So let me stop here and say why these assumptions. Well, the quadratic loss is going to turn out to be really useful because the difference between your optimal action and the forecast, sorry, your, your chosen action and your optimal action, the, the, the action you're going to want to choose is your best guess of what theta plus epsilon is. So this is going to be a conditional expectation of these things. And the square difference between your conditional expectation of something and its realization is a conditional variance. And so this is going to be really handy because it's going to mean that I don't have to keep track of the mean and the variance of somebody's belief. I'm going to be able to just use the variance. That's what this quadratic loss gets me. I could have some more general function that isn't a function of the square, but then I'm going to have to keep track of more information in my recursive problem. So this is similar to um, the global games literature often uses quadratic loss functions, and that performs a similar role of allowing them to keep track of, of you know, fewer variables that summarize the information of an agent. Okay, so this is sort of a little trick to reduce the state space, basically. Um, Laura, before, before we move on, do we lose anything by um, assuming that the learnable part, the theta, is entirely common, that there isn't a firm-specific component? Uh, Great. Great. Good question. So um, if it were entirely firm-specific, then the, the next thing I'm going to show you is trade and data. And so if it's fine to have an entirely firm specific, but then nobody would trade, nobody would buy yours. I would never want to buy your data because your data would be about your theta. And if your theta is independent of my theta, I can't learn anything about my state and your data is worthless to me. We made it entirely common, which is an extreme view, but we wanted there to be some trade in data. What would be an interesting enrichment of this model is to have a covariant structure where your state is similar to mine, it's maybe more similar to mine than somebody else's state. And so your data would be more valuable to me. It's not as valuable as my own data. My own data is perfectly informative about, or not perfectly, but my data is about my state. Your data is about a state that's correlated with mine. And we could think about different prices for different types of data that have different relevance. I think that's a really interesting direction to go with this, but to start, we just kept it simple. So, so perhaps like the way to think about it is maybe these are like the characteristics of our consumers or something about demand and then different firms, whether I'm selling, you know, groceries or electronics, I still want to know the characteristics of the customer base and, and we share that in common. That's, that's kind of. Yeah. Cool. yeah, that's right. So th maybe this is aggregate demand, right? And we're, we're learning about, uh, yeah, customers spending patterns right now. You know what, interest rates were just increased. Are they gonna keep buying durable goods? You know, well, I'm, uh, you know, this is the durable goods sector and, you know, this this state of consumers' willingness to, their, their aggregate demand for durable goods. This absolutely could rec represent a demand shock. This could represent some kind of fad or fashion. Maybe the optimal technique is, I'm thinking about producing shirts, right? And I've got a green shirt and you've got a red shirt. We're trying to figure out, you know, what's the fashionable shirt. I'm totally out of fashion. If they produce, you know, beautiful red shirts like Alexei, 
Alexa is they can sell them for twice as much money, right? So they'll count twice as much in GDP. Um, they'll be more valuable. That firm will get counted as more productive because it's producing more valuable red shirts as opposed to green shirts, which have similar capital inputs, but are only worth half as much, right? That, that's a way to think about an, an optimal technique. It could be aggregate demand, or it could be some kind of fine tuning. This could be about what to keep in inventory. We could think about states that have to do with procurement. Um, you know, this could be about, you know, finding the right match with good inputs that make your firm operate efficiently at a lower cost or with more reliability. Um, you know, there are all kinds of ways in which firms use data to kind of optimize and fine tune their production. And that's really where a lot of the value in the economy lies, right? The old fashioned notion of an economy is that value is generated by taking physical capital and workers and we put them together and that's the heart of value generation. And what I'm saying is, you know, if you've got a factory and you've got a bunch of workers and you put them together, but you're producing the wrong goods at the wrong time with the wrong suppliers and you're advertising to the wrong people, you may have produced a lot but your value added is nothing. Your firm is going to go out of business in no time. And so this is sort of a view that most of the value added comes from producing the goods that people want, from getting them to the right stores, from you know, advertising to the right people, you know, getting your parts in the right way. And all of that needs forecasting. It, these are all uncertain choices and they can be informed by data. And if you get that right, you have a much, much more valuable firm. So yeah, we need capital, but it's not really where most of the action is. Most of the action is in getting business right. Yeah, great. So, um, and I wanna put my uh, hide for the meeting, there we go. Okay, so data here is information for forecasting, right? So I alluded to this already, but I haven't told you exactly what a piece of data is. So at a time T, a firm is going to get a number of data points, NIT, about it, the state theta t plus one, right? Theta t plus one is this, this AR1 thing that, that determines your optimal technique. So my data is going to tell me like, what color shirts will people want tomorrow? And the number of data points I get is linked to the amount of production, the k to the alpha that I did, and a parameter that's specific to my firm. Okay, this piece isn't essential. But I think it's interesting to think about there being some firms that use data really effectively that have high data mining ability and some firms that don't. So what this equation represents is that data is a byproduct of production, right? Number of data points is a function of the number of units I produce, but it's scaled by some data mining ability. Okay, we're gonna take that as exogenous right now, but one might think of investments in data mining ability. And maybe there's some skilled labor that goes into data mining ability, right? You could make inference about the Z from maybe things like, you know, the IT investments of a firm or how many, you know, AI or machine learning skilled uh, data scientists they're hiring and so forth. You could try to measure it and you could try to endogenize it. But for right now, I won't. So each data point here is going to reveal something about the state. So a particular data point tells you how much do, uh, you know, what, what color shirt do, will people want tomorrow plus some noise, right? We don't want any of them to be perfect because otherwise you get one data point, and you're all done. So all of these should be noisy signals and there's some normal noise here. So I just want to stop here and point out that the model we've written down so far embodies something that we call the data feedback loop. So what I just showed you is that more transactions or more production generates more data. That's this equation right here. More production, more data. More data helps a firm operate with higher quality or more efficiency, right? That's this piece right here. Here's our quality. More data is going to reduce this error. It's going to allow me to track theta better, get a better technique closer to the optimum, shrink that thing. G is monotonically decreasing. We shrink its argument. A goes up. More quality. That's this branch. And then higher quality and efficiency is going to induce the firm, if it believes it has a higher A, it's going to choose a higher capital investment. That's a first order condition for the capital uh, equation. I haven't shown that to you yet, but you can imagine a firm that's more productive is going to want to be optimally bigger. That's the third piece of this. But notice that this is now self-reinforcing. A firm that gets bigger generates more data, gets, generates, operates more efficiently, 
it grows bigger, more data, and so forth. This is an increasing return spiral I'm describing to you, and it's right there embodied in our model, in the simple model we've written down already. And that's very different from a capital economy. Okay, so the last piece of the model is the market for data. So I'm gonna allow firms to buy and sell data, and we're gonna call delta the amount of data traded by firm I at time T. So if data is positive, I'll think of that as a data purchase. If delta is negative, we'll call that a data sale. Okay, and a firm can, in any period, <clears throat> a firm can buy or they can sell, but they can't do the same in the, both in the same period. I can buy today and sell tomorrow. I can buy and Alexa can sell in the same period, but I can't both buy and sell today. Okay, so, and this is important because otherwise you, you'll, as you'll see, you, you might, you probably, you won't have an equilibrium. So the data price pi T is simply the price that clears the data market that equates aggregate demand for aggregate supply of data. Data here is perfectly exchangeable because we've assumed firms have a common theta T. Okay, if that weren't true, then we'd have different kinds of data with different degrees of covariance, and we'd have to think of a more complex price. There wouldn't just be one price for data. There'd be a price for data that's really relevant to me and a different price for data that's less relevant to me. Data is multi-use. It's not perfectly rival. A firm can sell it and they can still use it. So we'll think of IOTA as being a fraction of sold data that's lost. Now, why would you use data? Why would you lose data? Sorry. Okay, well, one reason is if we don't do that, we won't have a competitive equilibrium. Because with perfect competition, no matter how much data I sell, I don't affect the price. That's what perfect competition is. I'm a price taker. I have no, I'm, I'm massless. I'm an atom. Um, and so if I don't lose any of the data and I don't affect the equilibrium price, and there's any positive price that I get for data, I'll just keep selling and selling and selling and selling and selling. So I'll make an infinite number of copies and everybody does that. And the only thing that could possibly happen is a price of zero. So we need it, but at the same time, also a lot of data contracts include prohibitions on how many people it will be sold to, on what the people who it's sold to could do with that data. But I think most importantly, this really captures imperfect competition. The truth is, that if I'm operating in an industry with a number of rivals and I sell my data to all my rivals, I will be less profitable. That data will have less value. At this stage, we don't wanna include imperfect competition because we're trying to figure out all the other pieces of the model and how they operate, but we wanna capture the idea that if you sell your data to everybody, its value is declining. And so we're gonna take a, a shortcut, a stand-in for that, and think of IOTA as being how much value does that data lose as captured by how much of that data is lost. Okay. Is it, is it lost in the same period with just from the transaction or from period to period? You won't, if you sell it this period, you won't have it next period. Gotcha. So it's kind of like depreciation. Yeah, that's right. There's a faster depreciation. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. There's a faster depreciation rate for data that you've sold. Okay. Okay. But we're gonna actually take it out of your data set. I mean, I think what, what really happens is that piece of data that you sold, you still have it, but it's gonna lose some value. Yeah. But then I'm gonna have to keep track of what you sold and what you didn't. They're kind of different bits of data. You're gonna make different inference from them. So I'm just gonna chop off part of that data you sold and think of it as like, you know, an iceberg sort of cost. It was sort of lost. It got erased when I sent it to you. Okay. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of a silly parable, but it allows us to get at this other idea, which is it really does lose value. So then the last piece of the model is we want a data adjustment cost. The reason you want to put that in is just to avoid one period convergence for exactly the same reason that models of firm dynamics with capital investment use capital adjustment costs because it allows for some meaningful firm dynamics. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about what results come out of this setting. First, I'll talk about valuing and depreciating data as an asset. Then what happens in the long run? We'll have diminishing returns, but you could, you could rejig the model a little bit and create endogenous growth. I'll show you a version of this model with some additional assumptions where data could be used for R&D. 
What happens in the short run? Well, in the short run, that increasing return spiral, that data feedback loop I showed you will be really important. And we'll talk about data barter, what we started talking about with the lemonade stand in the beginning. And then we'll introduce, you know, Mike, I'll briefly show you micro foundations, welfare and business dealing. Okay, so let's start with how does data depreciate? So let's think about using data to forecast an AR1 process. I, I simplified the AR1 process here just a little bit, made the mean zero just to make the exercise even easier to see. So you can think about a precision. How much do I know about theta at date T? So what is this precision? What does it mean how much I know? Well, how precisely can I forecast theta? This is a conditional variance. Forget about the inverse for a second. What is a conditional variance? It's an expected squared forecast error. It's my expectation of how far do I think my conditional expectation, which is a forecast, how far will my forecast be from the realization of theta and expected squared distance? Okay, so that's how far off will I predict theta to be from what it actually turns out to be. That's a conditional variance. I'm gonna invert it. That's what's known as precision. So one over how far away I expect to be. That's something that gets bigger if I get more precise, if I get closer to forecasting the right state. I'm gonna call that omega, and that's what we'll use the term stock of knowledge to be. How precisely can I, can I estimate today's state? Okay, now I can take that conditional variance or that conditional precision and think about what about tomorrow's state? How, given what I know today, my information set IT, I'm going to keep that the same. How uncertain would I be about tomorrow's state? That's a prior variance. Okay, well, I'm just going to take a variance operator and apply it to this equation. Variance on the left side, that's this conditional variance. What's the variance on the right side? Well, it's rho squared times the variance of theta t, the conditional variance. What's the conditional variance of theta t? Well, we've defined that to be omega inverse. So there's omega inverse. And then we've got this piece, this is independent of this. So the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. The variance of epsilon is this last sigma epsilon squared term here. Okay, so that's my prior variance of tomorrow's state. So if data forecasts theta t plus one, which is what we postulated in the model, they said data was about, you know, what color shirt will people want tomorrow? Then a data point is a signal about tomorrow's state with some signal noise. We'll call the noise of the signal sigma s squared. Now, Bayes law for normal variables says how precise will my beliefs be at t plus one depends on the prior precision. That's the inverse of this thing. That's right here, right? This is this conditional variance with an inverse. That's a prior precision plus the precision of the ns data points that I see. The precision of those ns data points turns out according to Bayes law to be ns times the precision of each of those signals. So ns times sigma s to the negative two. This is like a capital accumulation equation. Precision tomorrow is like tomorrow's capital. This term is, depends on time t precision. It's like the depreciated data that you're carrying over from time t. This is kind of the analog to the one minus delta kt term. And this is the new data that I'm gonna to add to my stock of knowledge. That's the new data inflows. That's kind of like investment, okay? So what's the analog to the, to the depreciation rate? Well, one minus delta k is this term divided by the state omega t, which means the delta here is one minus one over rho squared plus sigma epsilon omega t. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that data depreciation, data depreciates faster when it's abundant. That's a big omega t. And when the environment is really volatile, right, when it's changing a lot, then data that was about yesterday's preference for shirts, maybe yesterday, you know, green shirts were cool and the environment is changing rapidly. Today, red shirts are much more in vogue. Well, that means data yesterday about what customers want is not that relevant for today. It's not that informative. That would be a really high sigma epsilon squared. So now we have a way of thinking about what's the depreciation rate of data. Bayes' law tells us how to depreciate it, and it depends on the persistence, the innovations, how volatile is our state, how persistent is our state, and how much data did we have to begin with. Okay, so now we have a way of depreciating data. Okay, so semi-rival data. 
Remember we had this assumption that if you sell some data, you lose a fraction of the data you sold. That's the semi-rival piece. So for data purchases, that was what we called delta greater than zero. That meant you bought data. Then we're just gonna add every bit of data to your data stock. You're gonna get NIT, you know, NIT is the number of data points you produced. Um, you'll get that plus delta uh, to your data stock. But for data sales, the net additions are N plus iota delta. Why plus? You're like, I sold this, didn't I lose some? Remember, delta is negative. Okay, so we're going to add iota delta to your stock, but delta is negative, so we're subtracting an amount from your data stock. That's the amount that you lose because you sold your data and you lose a fraction of it when you sell. You can think of this as being there being an adjusted price of data per unit gained or lost, right? So the price of data per unit gained, if you buy, well, you just pay pi t per unit gained. We have pi divided by one, that's pi. But when you sell, the price per unit lost is not pi t, it's pi divided by iota, right? So you're getting more income, more price per unit of data forfeited because you don't have to forfeit every unit of data you sell. So that means there's a higher price for selling and a lower effective price for buying. That's a negative bid ask spread. So what I'm telling you is one way to think about semi rivalry in data is that we can use tools from finance for modeling economies with bid ask spreads to think about how to model this economy. Okay, so this is like an economy with a bid ask spread. It's just that the bid and ask go the opposite. The bid ask spread goes the opposite way. Okay, so with all these uh, tools in place, we can now think about our first stab of valuing data. Let me start by saying that the optimal choice of quality for a firm is simply their conditional expectation, their best guess, their forecast of theta plus epsilon. That was their optimal quality. What, what technique, sorry, their optimal technique. What technique do I wanna choose? I'd like to choose the optimal. I don't know exactly what the optimal technique is. I'm gonna choose my best guess, right? That's what we do with squared deviations. You can get that straight out of a first order condition. There are no dynamic consequences of choosing one quality today. You can just choose a different quality tomorrow. So if this is a conditional expectation, that means the quality is a function of a squared forecast error, right? That's what I showed you before. Quality depended on the square difference between this thing, this conditional expectation, and the realization of theta plus epsilon, the square difference between the two, the expectation of that square difference is a conditional variance. The inverse of that conditional variance is the conditional precision. That's what we've called the stock of knowledge. And I'm gonna define that as our state variable in the recursive equation. Okay, so what I've done here is I've substituted in the optimal technique choice, it's right here, so I should say your conditional expectation of theta plus epsilon is the same as your conditional expectation of theta because you don't know anything about epsilon. It was unlearnable and IID. You've got no, nothing. It, all you know is it's mean zero. And I'm going to think about the difference between that and theta as being the stock of knowledge. Actually, your quality is this thing um, plus the variance of the epsilon term inside the inverse. So it's not quite your expected quality. Okay, but you can see why I'm doing this because this gets out, this gets at, this is the, this is sufficient to determine your, the quality of your goods. Okay, this will be a sufficient statistic for everything the firm knows. So then what you can prove is that the optimal sequence of capital and data choices. So how much do I want to invest in this firm? How many data points do I want to buy or sell? solves a, a recursive equation with one state variable for symmetric firms. The value of having this stock of knowledge, this conditional precision, is a maximum over your capital investment, your data choice. What's the payoff? Well, your one period objective is, remember there's an equilibrium price that depends on how much everybody produces. We put that up on the first, first page of the model setup. It's your expected quality. That thing will depend on your stock of knowledge. It's this plus the variance of that epsilon inverse. It's the capital to the alpha that you choose. 
It's your data minus your data adjustment cost minus the amount you spend on, on data. But keep in mind that Delta could be negative. You might choose to sell data. If you choose to sell data, we have minus a negative Delta. So this is a source of revenue minus your capital rental costs plus discounted value tomorrow. Okay, here I'm just discounting with a simple riskless rate. This is sort of a tradition of macroeconomics. I'm very open to uh, finance criticism that says, hey, we should have a stochastic discount factor here. You know, sure, go for it. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible with the essential ingredients we need to think about a data economy. Okay, so then we need to have two things. We, the, the other piece of this problem we know, we need to know is how do we get from today's stock of knowledge to tomorrow's stock of knowledge. How does that state variable evolve? So two pieces to that. The first is the number of data points you're gonna get is remember your data savviness, your data processing ability, and the number of units you produce, K to the alpha. Remember that the data is a byproduct of economic activity. And tomorrow's stock of knowledge, this is the discounted stock of knowledge from today. It looks a little bit different before I showed you rho squared, Omega IT plus the variance of the AR1 innovations inverse. I said that was depreciated data. I added one more piece in here because you know one additional piece of information, which is at time T, you get to see what the quality of your own goods was. You know what action you chose. You know what revenue you got. That gives you one additional piece of information that I'm going to add on to your time T stock of knowledge but that's about time T quality or time T optimal technique. And so I'm gonna depreciate all of that with the persistence and the innovation in the A01 process, just like I showed you before. But I'm just depreciating your time T stock of knowledge and an additional piece of information that also needs to get depreciated. And then this is your new data inflows. This is the number of data points you generate from production. And then I'm gonna add the data points you bought. I'm gonna subtract data points that you lost if you sold some. Remember, if delta is negative, this will be a loss and you'll lose a fraction of iota. And then each one of those data points has precision, sigma epsilon to the negative two. So this is the total amount of data precision units that you're adding to your stock of knowledge. So this is your depreciated knowledge from time t with an additional signal you learned from about time t. And this is your new data inflows, which is information about the state at t plus one. So this is like your capital accumulation equation. Okay? And this thing defines a Bellman equation or a recursive problem that a firm could optimize. Any questions? That was a lot to go through. Any questions? Just real quick, um, you mentioned before that you can't handle both sales and purchases of data at the same time. Is right. that because it would effectively get around the iota? Is that what would happen? I'm trying to see how it would work. No, with the negative bid ask spread, you'd actually have an arbitrage. Uh, you'd have a money pump, which is I'm gonna sell you my data and I'm gonna and I'm gonna lose a fraction of it. Yeah. And I'm gonna buy it all back, and then I'm gonna sell you and and now I have more than what I started with, because I didn't lose all of it when I sold it. So I guess the price would go to zero immediately. Yeah. Clear. Yeah, the price would go to zero immediately. We'd sell an infinite amount. We would have effectively no uh, uncertainty. Um, maybe we could say an equilibrium exists with a zero price, would it, but it would right. be That's a very um, interesting equilibrium where everybody has an infinite amount of data. Right? I should say there's no finite equilibrium where everything stays strictly finite. Gotcha. And the, 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 the piece that you just mentioned where you um, also observe your own action, which means a linear combination of theta and epsilon, mm -hmm. that's, um, is there something where, is there an aggregation, you know, a Grossman Stiglitz where like, if, if we, if we all, if we each observe that and all our signals are independent, wouldn't like the price of the output or something like that allow us to learn other people's observations through some external thing like that? The price here is not 
I think what you have in mind is if we all were, if the price aggregated all this information, is yeah. that what you're asking about? Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, what's important, that's a great question. Um, prices depend on quality. Quality depends on not what level you think theta will be. It depends on the square difference between your forecast of the technique and the realized technique. Mm -hmm. So if quality, if theta were quality, for example, and we all got independent signals about theta, then a price that reflected quality would aggregate all of these infinite number of signals and reveal quality. Yeah. But theta is not quality. Theta is a technique and the square difference between that technique that's optimal and the one you choose determines quality. And so quality depends on a variance. Mm -hmm. And all the variances here are known. There are no uncertain variances. So that's why the price doesn't reveal the signal. It exactly. reveals the variances, which we already knew. That's right. So this is carefully constructed to make sure the price reveals nothing that you didn't already know so that we don't have to wrestle with learning from prices. And it's about that squared deviation. Gotcha. Yep. So there are other ways to do it. I'll show you in a little bit uh, the imperfect competition model I have, um, you know, has a role potentially for learning from prices and it looks more like a noisy rational expectations model. Um, but this is a way to bypass those, those problems. So the only way to write this model down. Um, but in this model, there is no learning from prices. Or there's nothing, I shouldn't say there's no learning. I'm not ruling it out. There's nothing to be learned from prices that you didn't already know. That's right. Okay, good. So um, understanding long run growth. So we can do sort of an analogy with a solo growth model. Any, any of you have taken undergraduate macroeconomics or maybe TA'd an MBA, you know, global economy or macro class um, have seen some version of a plot that looks like this, where this is the inflows of capital that come from savings and investment. And this is the depreciation outflow from capital and the economy grows when the inflows are greater than the outflows and it grows and grows and grows and we converge to a steady state right and the point is with diminishing returns to capital and economies can't grow in the long run well we've got something similar going on with data the inflow of data is the data savviness of the rep of we're going to think about symmetric firms here as a data savviness of a firm, the number of units it produces. Remember, data is a byproduct of economic activity. So this is the number of data points each firm is producing. And this is the precision of those data points. So that's the net inflow of data into this economy. There could be some additional if they trade and so forth. You can kind of generate some more. But this is that, that inflow. Um, and that's going to be concave. The outflow data depreciation is not actually linear. This is a numerical plot of model that I just showed you. It looks linear. There's some significant nonlinearity down here, but it can be very close to linear. And in the paper with Mariam Farbudi, we, we prove some conditions under which this thing is approximately linear. The important thing is it not concave. It can be convex. Okay, so that means that you've got the same sort of logic as goes on with the solo growth model that inflows exceed outflows. This firm accumulates more data. It gets more stock of knowledge. This is the flow of new knowledge. This is knowledge being lost due to depreciation. This is knowledge being gained due to new data generation. And eventually those two converge and growth stops. And there are two reasons that this is happening. The inflows are concave. Well, first of all, you can't reduce your forecast errors below zero. The best you can ever do is achieve zero conditional variance. And so if your quality depends on how far away you are from some optimum, if I've got a million data points, I am really close. I can get very, very close to that optimum. If I get a billion data points, I can get a tiny bit closer, but really it's a small improvement. Once I have a ton of data, I can do really great forecasts already. And additional data doesn't get me as much additional value here. The other reason there's diminishing returns is even if a perfect forecast could generate infinite output or infinite GDP, 
you can't get to a perfect forecast. And that's where that unlearnable risk comes in. Remember, there was a piece of the optimal technique the data will never teach you about. And because data can never teach you about it, no matter how much data you get, you're going to converge to a finite amount of quality because you can't resolve that remaining risk. So as long as there's something about tomorrow's state that is not a deterministic function of something you can possibly observe today, you will have unlearnable risk in your economy. And when you've got unlearnable risk in your economy, it's almost impossible to structure economy that it grows unboundedly from data accumulation alone. Okay, so we have diminishing returns in the long run. You can overcome that. Um, in what the economy I've described so far, data added to current productivity, it did not augment a stock of ideas. So we could write down a slightly different model where data improves idea creation. So in this different model, I'm going to structure quality differently. Quality today will be quality yesterday. I've got ideas about generating a technology for generating quality, and I'm going to add to that technology. I'm going to accumulate ideas. How much I add to ideas might depend on a research technique and how close that is to its optimum. So if that research technique is really far away from the optimum, I might not even undertake that research and I'll get zero and I won't add anything to my stock of quality, my stock of ideas. But if I've got some really great data, I might determine, find a better technique that I add to my stock of ideas and I could accumulate idea creation. So in this simple model of, of you know, quality, it really looks more like technology. Uh, data increases a step size. This is the step size. This is the increase in the stock of knowledge or stock of technologies. And this is a quality ladder model and it generates growth. Now, does that mean data really doesn't have diminishing returns or does it mean data does have diminishing returns? I sort of told you one thing and then I said, no, really it doesn't. What do you make of this? What you make of this is one should distinguish data used for research. That's what this is. This is data used to produce new ideas to add to the stock of knowledge. You should distinguish that from data used for process optimization, used for advertising to customers or forecasting the color of the shirt we ought to produce or you know, figuring out how to you know, do better procurement or something like that. And we do that kind of distinction all the time. When we think about capital investment, we distinguish factories, machines from research and development, R&D investment. We have a separate category for R&D. We should be doing the same for data. The stuff that's being used for process optimization is going to have diminishing returns. The stuff that's used for research and development does not and has significantly different consequences for growth and welfare. So the point is, in the long run, data looks just like capital. Okay. Kind of nothing new there, but, but it looks like capital for different reasons, right? The logic is still quite different. The economics are different. In the short run, things look very different. So I'm going to think about in the short run, a single firm entering in a market where all the other firms are in steady state. And then we'll think about how that firm grows, what its dynamics would look like. And we can get the convex data flow. So there exists some parameters and a threshold such that when knowledge is scarce, right? So this is how much knowledge we have. This is our stock of knowledge. It's kind of like in the solo model, this is our stock of capital and economy. And this is inflows and outflows of knowledge. We've got convexity, meaning if we have more knowledge, we accumulate more knowledge per period. The accumulation of knowledge is speeding up here. And why is that happening? This is the data feedback loop going on. When I'm really small, the goods I produce are terrible. They're really low quality. Nobody wants to buy them. I do few transactions because the goods I'm producing are terrible. And because I do few transactions, I don't generate much data. I can buy some data. That's the difference between the dashed line, that's my data production, which is really low, and the data inflows, the difference between those two, that gray area is data purchases. But you know, when I'm really unproductive, my goods are terrible, I don't have a lot of incentive to go out and spend more and buy more data, and I got that data adjustment cost to, to, to grapple with. And so I'm slowly producing data and buying data and getting a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. This suggests that new firms in a digital economy could grow kind of slowly, right? They're going to sort of accumulate. They're going to grow really slowly because the flow of knowledge, that's kind of the rate at which they're moving along the x-axis, is very slow. 
But once they get enough knowledge, knowledge, they're going to explode. Okay. And this could explain firm size divergence. If you start two firms on this trajectory with slightly different initial stocks of knowledge, or maybe slightly different data savviness, those ZI parameters and how much data they generate per transaction, they're going to diverge. One is going to take off a little earlier than the other. When it takes off, its level of knowledge will be quite different from the firm that was slightly different. But then eventually they should converge as we get to uh, the diminishing returns part and get closer and closer to steady state. This looks sort of like models of growth traps or you know the, the debate about convergence in economic growth. In this model, you could also get data barter. So barter means data is exchanged for the good. I'm going to think about a pure barter. You could have a price P of zero. And we've talked about how lots of data is bartered for services like your phone apps and, and that there's partial barter going on. That's happening in this model too. But I can show you there's a pure barter trade that can arise in this model and it would arise early in a firm's life. Firms would produce goods at a loss, zero revenue, but in order to generate data. And why would they do that? They would do that because their value function, this is the Bellman equation value, increases in the stock of knowledge. So what they're getting is not revenue, but they're getting data. They're getting a higher stock of knowledge, which can increase the value of the firm, right? And so this model gives you a way of thinking about how GDP is missing lots of digital economic activity because price doesn't fully reflect the value of the goods or services being sold, right? And we can start to think about ways to correct it. One way to think about to correct is if you couldn't get a price where no data was being transferred, and then you could see a price where data was transferred. Maybe there's a price in a state like California that's got strict privacy requirements, and there's a price in the rest of the country where a firm can monetize your data, sell it to third parties, exploit it fully. The difference in those prices might tell us something about what's the value of that data, what is the implicit data payment going on in two goods. I don't think anybody's done that, but that's one way you might start getting at, you know, what are these, what are these sort of price, what's the nature of this barter trade and partial barter payments going on with data? Could you also use this model to think about these policies, you know, in the EU, California, et cetera, about being able to control your, old da your, your data and actually sell it as opposed to barter it and it seems like it would affect capital allocation in this model and growth and, and everything. Absolutely. Yep. So this model is built very much as a framework for thinking about these kinds of regulatory questions. Um, some of them you could probably think about with a perfect competition model. Some of them you might want imperfect competition. Um, I realize I'm at about 10. I'm going to go another 20 or so minutes before our break, but my second two segments will be a little bit shorter and we're going to get to imperfect competition. Uh, in just a second. And you can think about sort of some regulatory questions, like maybe pure efficiency and privacy questions. A perfect competition model like this might be good to think about. And you could put, you know, data sharing, data use uh, requirements or, or, you know, prohibitions in this model um, and, and ask what sorts of effects they have, they have. So one thing, this last piece is relevant to what you're suggesting, the sort of regulatory questions, which is so far I've given you a very rosy picture of how data is used. It's all used to increase quality, right? What could be more warming to the heart of an economist than something that's used to increase the productivity or quality of a firm? Um, nobody is stealing from anybody. It's all very, you know, happy and lovely. Well, you know, in reality, lots of data is used for advertising, which is arguably just stealing customers who might have bought a different form of, might have bought a different brand of shirt or a different, you know, whatever, bought something from your customers and luring them to you, okay? And so we can adjust quality so that data processing helps the firm that uses it, but has no social value or has some social value, but it's not all adding to welfare. Some of it is stealing. And this is taking a, a, a trick out of the book of, you know, Morris and Shin 2002, uh, their AER paper on the social value of information. And we're specifying quality as this is like our G function. Remember, it was decreasing in the squared forecast errors you make. Here, I want to make that G function linear. And then I'm going to add on a pure externality. 
So this is this first part corresponds to just a specific example of the quality we were looking at before, where g is a linear function. The new piece I'm adding to it is this. I'm going to add on the squared deviations that everybody else in the market makes. So when they screw up, you get better quality. And so what happens in this economy, in this world, if I ask what is aggregate quality? Well, I'm going to integrate over all the firm quality on the left side. I'm going to integrate over all firms in the right side. I'll get a bar. That's just a constant over all firms that integrates out. I'll get an integral of this term over all fir firms. Plus, this thing's already an integral over all firms. I've got a continuum of, mat of unit one. So I'm just going to get an integral of something that's already integrated, it's like a constant, so I get minus the integral over for all firms plus the integral over all firms, they cancel out, the aggregate quality is A bar. So there's no social value to data. I can create some social value to data, I'm just going to put a little multiplier here in, term, in front of that red term. If I put a multiplier between 0 and 1, I'm getting a little bit of social value or a lot of social value, depending on how close we are to 1 or to 0. So I can think about data that has some negative externalities on the other firms when you use it. So what's unchanged in this model? Firms' choices are exactly the same. This term, my choice as firm I, does not affect it in any way. I'm mass zero in here. So I don't change anything I do. The firm dynamics don't change, aggregate output. The quality changes, welfare changes. I'm going to refer you to the paper for micro foundations. I don't have time to go into that in order to think about welfare. You want to think about actual households and household utility and unbundle that demand curve I put in the beginning and the paper with Mariam does that. So bottom line for all of this in the short run, the data economy looks quite different. We get barter trades, we get increasing returns, we get firm size divergence, we can get these externalities and the industrial error measurement tools we're using of GDP is just, you know, price times quantity and price is just monetary price is really problematic. Okay, so now I want to take the last few minutes in this first segment and talk to you about imperfect competition, because I said that that's a big concern in data economics. So this is going to be a slightly different model. Still, data is information. Information resolves some uncertainty. We're going to model this as uncertain consumer demand, and now we're going to have a variety of products. So not just one random state, but, you know, we're going to have demand for, you know, pink stuff and demand for shirts and demand for tables and chairs and cars and gadgets and things. And firms here are going to price risk. Okay, so anybody who's sat through a corporate finance class knows that there's lots of evidence that firms price risk and we teach students to price risk. We teach managers to do it. We're going to build that into an imperfect competition model. That should be pretty uncontroversial with this group, but in IO, they're, you know, well, why should firms price risk? And it's a pretty controversial thing to stick in. So firms are going to choose an upfront investment and then choose how many units to produce. So this is going to look kind of like Cournot competition, but it's going to be a souped up version of a Cournot model with a, a rich product space. And then we'll look at data's competing effects on markups. In the paper, there's a whole segment. This is now the paper with Jan Ekau. There's a whole section about markup measurement. So data creates some interesting composition effects. And in this world where firms use data to resolve uncertainty, but also to help them you know, to grow bigger and to figure out what to produce, exactly how you measure markups matters enormously. A product markup and a firm markup can have different trends. An industry markup that's sales weighted and an industry markup that's cost weighted can have different trends. An industry markup that's just total industry revenue divided by total industry cost. cost could have different cyclical properties than, than these other measures. And so, you know, all these measures and, and in, in empirical work, people are really, you know, confused and at odds and worrying with each other about what are, what are the properties of markups because they're measuring them in different ways. And I'm not going to go into that today. I'll just sort of highlight that's in that paper. Okay, two slides on this model. First, we're going to think about a finite number of firms indexed by I, right? That's the big deviation from the previous model. No more continuum. These firms are finite. They know they affect the market that they're in. They know they affect prices. We'll have a product space that has N attributes. Those are indexed by J, right? Think about an attribute as a color or an attribute could be, is it a shirt or pants? An attribute could be, is it a wood table or a plastic table or, you know, is it an iPad? They're goods that are indexed by K that are combinations of attributes, right? 
So my shirt is a combination of the green attribute and the shirt attribute, and there are going to be weights on each of these, right? Maybe it's one part green and one part shirt, or you know, one part green, a part one third a part weight on cotton, two thirds on rayon, whatever you have, whatever have you. So these weights are AJK. So a firm is going to choose an investment in lowering their marginal cost CI. I want you to think of that as building a bigger factory. If I build a big automated factory. I can produce green shirts and churn them out at very low cost, but they've got to pay an upfront cost to build that really big efficient factory. It's a function of the cost, so lower cost, a lower marginal cost, bigger upfront cost for building the factory, and there's a parameter chi C in there. It's just there so that later on we can think about making marginal costs higher or lower with some comparative statics. And they're going to choose a quantity to produce QI that's a vector to maximize the utility of the firm. The objective of the firm is maximize expected profits minus this is their price of risk and this is their amount of risk. And this is simply part of expected profits. That's just that cost of building the factory up front. So what's profits? Profits is quantity times the price minus the marginal cost. Marginal cost CI is the marginal cost of an attribute. This A is a matrix that has JK entry a, or sorry, that has JK entry AJK. And so this is mapping marginal cost of attributes into the marginal cost of the good. Okay, so the A matrix maps attributes into goods. You can think of this as a good is a portfolio of risky attributes. Okay, this is going to kind of look like, a, you know, a, a choosing risky assets. That, and maybe the risk, or you can think of the risky assets, the risky goods, they have unknown return, depend on a portfolio of underlying characteristics or a portfolio of error securities. So row I is firm I's price of risk. One might think about it as coming from a cap M. Not all this risk will be, um, will be uh, systematic. Well, some of it may be idiosyncratic. Um, you know, maybe only the systematic part gets priced, that's going to get rolled into row I, or maybe this comes from manager's preferences who's worried about things like firm bankruptcy and makes him care about idiosyncratic risk. We can have a whole bunch of rich theories about exactly what this price should be and how it might vary depending on the, the type of risk a firm faces. Okay, so demand. Customers' willingness to pay decreases in the amount that all firms produce of an attribute. Okay, so if there's tons of green stuff out there, the value of producing additional green stuff goes down. You've saturated the market with green, you know, apparel. Um, but it might not affect the, the cost of red stuff. So there's a price of the attribute and there's a firm specific shock BI. So this is a customer's willingness to pay. This will turn out in equilibrium to be the price of the good. It depends on a parameter, PE lower bar, minus this is the price elasticity of demand. This is the total supply of that attribute, how much all firms are producing of it. So if we produce tons of tables, the price of tables goes down, and then the firm has a firm specific attribute specific shock. It's a vector, it's normal zero I, and it's IID across firms. But this is the valuation of an attribute. The valuation of a good is simply linear in the valuation of the attribute. So if I have a price three on green and a price five on a shirt, my price of green shirt is eight, three plus five. Data is information about the demand shocks, which are exogenous. A firm is gonna have NDI data points for firm I. That's gonna be, those data points are independent across firms. And we're gonna think about the number of data points here as being exogenous, okay? In the previous model I showed you, number of data points was generated by economic activity. This is not a dynamic model. This is a one-shot static game. And the question is very different. The question here is really about how does data affect measures of firm competition? Not where does data come from or how do these firms evolve or does it generate long-run growth? A very interesting next step is to merge those two to create a dynamic model with imperfect competition endogenize where the data points come from and so forth, that's not a step anyone has taken yet. Okay, so for right now, we're just thinking a firm I is endowed with NDI number of data points. Okay, so, you know, Alexei has 15, I've got three of them, that's just the way it is. We're gonna see how we compete. Each data point is a signal about BI, it's got some signal noise. And so the information set here will be, I know all of my signals, I've got NDI of these signals, each signal is indexed by Z. 
I'm also gonna let a firm see everybody else's signals. What does that do? Well, everybody else's signals aren't informative about my firm specific demand shock. Okay, that's intentional. It just simplifies things a lot. The paper with Jan has a version of this where you don't see other people's data and we have some common shocks and so forth. But in that world, I've got a firm forecast about what quantity I think Alexei will produce, right? And so that creates an additional forecasting problem. It's an interesting forecasting problem. It's not relevant to the main to the results I'm going to show you here. So we simplify the model to make no information asymmetry. Everything that Alexei knows, I know, but there's more data available about my firm specific shock than about his firm specific or sorry about his firm specific shock. He had more data points than mine. I can see all his data points, but they don't help me figure out how much customers will like my products. Okay. So these are not the most realistic assumptions. They're assumptions that keep the model simple and a richer version of the model in the appendix has common shocks. So you can think about this as like an aggregate demand shock and I don't get to see Alexei's signal. I have to form beliefs about them. So the first order condition in a model like this is that production depends on risk and price impact and the expected profit. So if, you, if you've seen a Kyle 89 model where there's a noisy rational expectations economy and there's a finite number of investors and they take account of the fact that they affect their price, this looks kind of like that. It's not exactly the same. There's some subtle differences, but it's kind of like that. What quantity do you produce of your goods? It's kind of like asking in that world, how many shares of each risky asset do you want to buy? Well, that depends on the expected payoff. Here that expected payoff is how much can I sell each good for? I don't know how much I can sell them for. That depends on that demand shock BI that's random, but I form an expectation over it and it depends on the marginal cost. But then that expected payoff per unit, I have to divide it by my risk price times my risk. My risk is conditional variance plus a term that's basically DPDQ. How much do I think my production in a Kyle 89 model is how much do I think my demand for the risky asset here? It's how much does this firm think their production will affect the equilibrium price of their good? Okay, so this is the first order condition. You can sort of work it out by substituting the budget constraint and the optimization and so forth. But what this means is that there's a sensitivity of production to a change in expected price, right? Here's the expected price. How much do I change my quantity if the expected price goes up a little bit? Well, that's this first term here. I'm going to call that HI, okay? This two over phi IN, that turns out to be DPDQ. That's the solution to an equilibrium. Now, what does data do here? Data lowers conditional variance. It makes me le uh, more sensitive. It makes this thing lower, but with an inverse, it makes the inverse higher. So it makes HI higher. So it makes, it makes quantities more sensitive to prices. HI governs the covariance between prices and quantities. When I've got more data, the quantity I produce is more responsive to changes in expected price. Data allows a firm to choose quantities that co-vary with prices. That's what a firm wants to use data for, right? They want to be able to produce more green shirts when green shirts will be really profitable. They want to produce more red shirts tomorrow if red shirts are in high demand and will earn twice the market price. So they want to use data to forecast what demand will be and figure out what to produce. And that you see as data increases the covariance of prices and quantities. So the optimal choice of, of uh, a factory, the optimal choice of the marginal cost is like how big a factory to build. That's simply how does my expected utility change in that factory size uh, pr uh, choice variable. There's a marginal cost that's simply, well, here's the cost function. Marginal cost is differentiated with respect to the cost variable. That's pretty straightforward. But the benefit depends on how profitable do I think the goods produced by this factory will be, the expected value of price minus cost, and a term that depends on HI. Remember, HI is increasing in data. When I've got more data, the marginal benefit of building a bigger firm goes up. Data induces firms to grow bigger. And that's where the competition worries come from, from concerns like, you know, is Facebook just an enormous megalith because it, you know, data has induced them to grow bigger and acquire more firms and, and so forth and become market dominant. 
Okay, so um, there's a whole bit about markups here. Uh, we can define the markup as the expected price divided by the marginal cost. This is a mathematical expression for it. What makes markups large here? Well, producing stuff that people want and a low price elasticity. Those are completely unsurprising. Nobody has ever done IO would be shocked by either of those statements, but there's a new piece to markups here, which is that scarce data or a high price of risk will raise the H's here. And so what happens here is this expression for a markup has a risk premium in it. The markup compensates firms for the fact that they bear risk when they produce. They don't know exactly how much revenue they're going to get per red shirt, per green shirt. And so they're going to need to be compensated for that risk they're bearing. Remember, data resolves risk. And so it's going to affect that risk premium as well as the optimal size of a firm. So there are two competing effects here. Data investment complementarity. Remember, I told you data lowers the choice of marginal cost. Basically, data induces the firm to build a bigger factory and produce more efficiently. And that higher investment, the lower C choice, raises product markups. If you lower your marginal cost, the price of the good will fall, but it won't fall by as much as the marginal cost, right? You can see the imperfect pass through right here. Marginal cost goes down. The price will not go down one for one because I won't raise my quantity in lockstep with that marginal cost reduction. There's, it's mediated by risk and market power. So when the marginal cost goes down, the expected price goes down by a little bit less. And so the markup goes up. This firm becomes more profitable. Which it should, it builds a more efficient factory, right? It's, it's extracting more of that profit, but it's gonna show up as a higher markup. But markups also reduce risk. So if I hold the size of the factory fixed by making it really expensive to move the size of the factory, if I don't let this firm reduce marginal cost, or at least not very much, um, data reduces the, markup, the product markup. So the expected prices go down. Why? Because data's resolved risk for this firm. It's made it less uncertain. If it can predict very precisely what will be the return to producing red shirts or green shirts, well, it's conditional variance is lower. It doesn't need as much risk premium. To undertake that same activity because that activity is risky. So data de-risks firm activity and by reducing risk it can reduce and resolve risk premium. So the net effect of data on markups is that data increases product markups when the risk price or the marginal cost of investment is really low but it decreases product markups when risk price or the marginal cost of investment is sufficiently high. Data does not have a one directional effect on markups. It affects market competition in nuanced and different ways, but specifically it depends on what's a firm's price of risk relative to how flexibly can they change their marginal cost of production? Can they scale up or automate or so things that allow them to produce in different ways? I'm gonna skip over this because I've gone on for a long time. There's some interesting aggregation effects and how firm level markups are produced. Data creates a wedge between product and firm markups. The more data there is, the more the firm markup will deviate from a product markup. And let me just try to explain that to you intuitively. A firm markup depends on the mix of goods that the firm produces. It depends on the covariance between prices and quantities. If I produce a lot of really high markup goods, because I found out the red shirts are gonna be super profitable to produce tomorrow, then I'm gonna put more weight. I'm gonna produce more. Those high markup goods, the red shirts will get weighted more in my firm markup and my firm markup will go up. This is exactly the same thing as in finance, thinking about portfolio alphas. If a fund manager can put a lot of weight, can buy a lot of assets that turn out to be high return, their portfolio return will be higher than the average return of the assets that they buy because they had information to pick the assets that systematically had high returns. The firm is doing the same kind of thing here. And so it turns out that the difference between firm and product markups can be a nice measure of data. And it fits a bunch of empirical evidence for similar aggregation reasons. The sales weighted markup should go up much more than the cost weighted markup. If data is growing in an economy, and that's what we see in empirical work. 
Sales weighted markups should increase more than industry aggregate markups, and that wedge also increases. So all of this evidence is consistent with growth and firms data, which creates these composition effects. It allows firms to choose high markup goods. The firms that have that data grow bigger. They get weighted more. Their sales are higher relative to their costs. And so these high markup firms are getting weighted more. The sales weighted markup is going up. All of this is a composition effect, but it all helps to make sense of these kind of different pieces of evidence in the empirical literature. Okay. That's it for our first piece. I just want to leave you with some ideas about where to go with all of this. Dynamic imperfect competition is kind of an obvious next step. There are a lot of next steps here. This talk is sort of filled with ideas that are don't have answers yet. So one would be how do you combine a recursive economy with a static imperfect competition model? There's a challenge here, which is every firm's information matters for the price. All the information sets are state variables. So the big challenge in working with these kinds of structures is how to keep the state space really contained. But there are a lot of potential payoffs from going this route. You can understand new firm dynamics in a digital economy. We can think about how to measure competition, especially when there are lots of zero prices out there. If there's a zero price, what's a markup, right? Markup was supposed to be expected price over expected marginal cost. Well, if the price is zero, is the markup zero? Well, you know, maybe we still have expensive apps. Maybe I'm paying too much data for my weather app. Right, and I'm getting exploited in that way. So we got to rethink what some of these what some of these measures are, and theory will help us form ideas about what's the right way to measure it that's more meaningful. How do we value firms, many of which have never made a profit? Lots of young digital firms. Amazon didn't make profits for the first six years of its existence, um, but it had enormous value, and that value turned out to be well justified. What if we add firm entry to this mix? What about welfare? Should we tax data? Should we put restrictions on selling data? Or maybe customers are already getting compensated for the use of their data because they're getting goods and services at a lower price than they already would, right? These are the kinds of issues that these frameworks allow us to wrestle with, but none of these questions are clearly answered in this literature. All of them are space for, for future research. So economists cannot continue to study industrial economies. For God's sake, we live in a knowledge economy, at least in the US. The economy doesn't look anything like the standard structures that were taught in first year macro. We need more modern tools that reflect this reality. And policymakers need more modern tools to measure with and to design policy with. Knowledge economies are not easy to work with, but I tried to show you a structure that wasn't a lot harder to work with than a standard DSGE model. It's gonna miss some things and we're gonna have to refine it, but it had that production generates data. Data depreciation was not standard. It, it depended on the information environment. We had semi rivalry. We had increasing returns and then decreasing returns. We had information state variables. And then we, we introduced models with, with markup power, with, with market power uh, and, and a notion of markups. And so, you know, there are a lot of pieces in place that are taking us on the road to thinking about how do we model more modern economies. So, after our, our break, uh, we're going to talk about data and financial markets, data platforms, and then in the third piece, measuring and valuing data. So I think we covered a lot of ground and we have a well-deserved break here. Are we doing 10 minutes, Alexei? Is what that... would you like? Okay, let's, let's reconvene in 10 minutes. I have 10.28, so we'll restart at 10.38, and the next two sections will, uh, will be uh, substantially shorter. Great. We'll be back at 1038, everyone. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Take it away. Okay, part two. There we go. Okay, thanks for coming back. Part two, the financial data economy. So we're gonna start with, we're gonna think about questions like data is a valuable asset for investors. How valuable? What should be an investor? I should say specifically somebody who's forming a portfolio of risky assets and trying to forecast their expected returns. What should be their willingness to pay? This is a question about a demand. It's not a question about an equilibrium transactions price. An equilibrium transactions price depends on demand and on supply. So we're gonna to try to just get at that demand piece for data for a financial investor. Now data valuation is not easy. 
How much you can profit from a piece of data depends on who else knows that data, right? We, we know from Grossman and Stiglitz, if everybody knows piece of data, it's value or information, it's, it's value goes to zero, right? So who else knows it? Who else knows, what about a piece of data that's similar to this, right? That has a lot of the same, maybe highly correlated with it, but not the same. What if a lot of people know that? What if there's a whole spectrum of data out there that's imperfectly correlated and you have no idea how much everybody else knows of what? There's some things you might think are probably more public than others, but trying to measure that seems impossible. And furthermore, even if you knew what was public and what was private and what half the market knew and a third of the market knew, you'd have to know other things like how aggressively would they trade on it? Do the people who know this only trade large assets or only trade small assets or only trade value assets? Um, what are the risk profiles? So all of these things would determine how valuable that data is to you. So this just creates impossible data requirements to try to ask the simple question, if I'm about to form a portfolio of risky assets, what should I be willing to pay for this piece of data? I'd have to know everybody else's data sets, preferences, price impacts, their investment mandates, and so forth. So we're going to think about how to get around that sort of problem. Data value and market power, we're going to come back to the market power uh, issue we were talking about in the first section, but in the context of a financial market, here market power is like price elasticity, right? So there's a lot about demand elasticity in financial markets. If demand is very elastic, that means that DP, DQ, I don't affect the price very much. If the price, if my quant, if I sell a little bit and the price dips just a tiny bit, somebody swoops in to buy, that's a low price impact. So those things, those ideas of elasticity and market power are linked and they interact in interesting ways with data and each affects the other. So we'll talk about that, you know, that sort of linkage between market power and demand elasticity and data valuation. And then in, in this last piece of this, I'll talk a little bit about dealers as being data platforms and how we might model that. Okay. So let's jump right into this. This is a noisy rational expectations model with a rich set of investor uh, heterogeneity and covariances. This is based on a paper with Mariam Farbudi, Dhruv Singhal, and Venki Venkateshwaran. Um, before I start, let me say the point of this model is not, um, that is not like the first part of the talk. The first part of the talk, I was showing you what's the minimal bit of modeling assumptions that I can put in to get some meaningful notion of what's going on. This is not a minimal model. This is a model where there are lots of whistles and bells that are not at all necessary to the results that are thrown in there. There's all kinds of investor heterogeneity, restrictions of potentially on their investment style, differences in risk preferences, what, you know, really general data covariant structure. None of this stuff is necessary. Why is it in there? Because this is a model that's meant for measurement. And I'm going to show you that despite all of this heterogeneity, all of these whistles and bells, this is sort of the most souped up, pimped out, noisy rational expectations model somebody can write. We're still going to get a really simple set of sufficient statistics for valuing data. Okay. So the, the objective of this model and the style of this model are really different. This isn't a minimal set of necessary assumptions. Okay. So we're going to have uh, one riskless asset um, n risky assets. So now we're thinking about dividends of those assets. This DT is a vector. So it's the dividend, it's an N by one vector of the dividends of each of the N risky assets. It's an AR1 process, persistence G, innovations YT plus one. Those innovations are normal. We can come back, there's some sort of backup slides at the end about what happens if this isn't normal. That's an interesting question for data valuation, but let's start with normality. They're IID across time. If they weren't IID, we should roll them into the persistent part and they can be correlated across assets. Furthermore, this G matrix does not need to buy it, be diagonal. So we've got this really rich potential covariant structure in dividends. The innovations could be correlated. We could have aggregate shocks to dividends. We could have dividend yesterday affects dividend today across firms. Maybe there's some supply chain that creates linkages between them. All of that stuff's possible in this structure. There's going to be some stochastic demand, right? These are our, our classic noise traders and noisy rational expectations models. You usually need them to make the price not perfectly revealing. In this setting, you don't actually strictly need noise traders, and I'll show you why. 
Um, but you know, if you don't like the idea of noise traders, some people object to them out of hand because they don't have well-defined utility functions. It's actually pretty easy to microfound these guys as being people with motives to hedge non-financial income. So that's something that um, Cespa and Vives do um, that I've done in a paper years ago with Pablo Curlot. Um, you know, you can you you can make this less objectionable, but let's just keep this piece simple. There are n overlapping generations investors indexed by I, and they have heterogeneous preferences and investment sets. So in the paper, we go more into what's an investment set. It basically means there's some assets that maybe you can't hold, right? So you might have you might have an investment mandate that says you only trade in large assets. You only trade in stuff in the S&P 500. You only trade, you're a value investor. You only buy and sell risky assets that are value assets. Again, this is one of these assumptions, not necessary, but if you wanna put those kinds of restrictions in there, you can do it. And actually it'll matter a lot for data value. So the expected utility of this investor uh, is, well, their expected utility of their consumption, and it's gotta be concave, they gotta be risk averse. A data point here is a noisy signal about the dividend innovation, right? So what's, we know today's dividends, they paid out. What's uncertain? Well, what will be tomorrow's dividends? The uncertain piece is YT plus one. That's the only random thing. Well, that, and you, it could actually be a signal about the stochastic demand. So Mariam Farbudi and I have an AER paper where there's learning about this noise trade component. And that actually works just fine in this model too. But we'll write it for now as the innovation, the dividends. Um, data can be correlated with what others know. So let's write down this rich structure of, of signals, the signals about the dividend innovation, but it can have public noise and it can have private noise and they can have different weights on them. You could set this zeta to zero and this is a perfectly private signal, right? This is like a signal from Edmati 85. Everybody gets independent signals. You could make the variance of this piece zero and you could have perfectly public information. If you learn it, you see the same thing as everybody else. That's kind of like the Grossman Stiglitz notion of information. If you learn the, I think they called it the theta and the payoff, you learn the same thing that everybody else learns. And you could have stuff that's imperfectly correlated. It could have some of both, right? So rich possibilities for the kinds of signals that people are seeing and to what extent they're known by others. Your information set is everything you knew yesterday, plus your data set, your signals, plus the dividend that you saw the day, and you learn from prices. Equilibrium here is that investors learn from prices and data, and they update beliefs with Bayes' law. They choose their portfolios, so the numbers of shares of all the risky assets to maximize ex expected utility, accounting for their price impact. Okay, so this is a model where firms, we, we could take N to infinity and have them, in, sorry, investors, we could take the number of investors to infinity and have price impact go to zero. That's a special case of this model, but we can have price impact. And the price will still equate demand and supply. So we still get a linear price expression. Price depends on a constant. It depends on today's re realized dividends. It depends on the dividend innovation that people are learning about through their noisy signals, their data. It depends on the noise traders and it depends on the public component of the signals. And here you can see why you might not need noise traders in this model anymore, because you have a source of noise that's the public component of the signals. So if we've got public noise and signals and the weight on that is non-zero, you could actually potentially dispense with your noise traders. It gets a little bit more complicated. People can start to make some inference about this from their signals, but there'll be some piece of it they don't know and prices won't be perfectly revealing. Okay, so we've got a general utility function that's just risk averse, it's just concave. Um, we're gonna do a second order approximation to expected utility that's gonna get us mean variance, okay? And we're gonna have an absolute risk aversion parameter, but I don't want you to think, oh, this was just CARA preferences all along. This is not constant absolute risk aversion. This risk absolute risk aversion is present for every utility function has some level of absolute risk aversion defined for every level of wealth or every level of consumption. So this thing can and will be dependent on the level of wealth of the investor. So there are wealth effects here. It's just that we're going to roll those into what is your level of absolute risk aversion in this period for investor I. Okay, so we're taking a local 
quadratic approximation to utility that does not in any way rule out wealth effects. That's important because wealth effects are gonna matter for data values. So we wanna be really careful not to rule them out with our utility specification right off the bat. Okay, and then we have a budget constraint. The consumption at the end of the period is the wealth you started with minus all of the spending you did on risky assets. That's the riskless asset that you keep. You get the rate of riskless return for that. And it's the quantity times the payoff of all your risky assets. Payoff here is tomorrow's price plus dividend because these are long-lived assets. Okay, so how do we solve this model? Well, the first order condition with respect to the quantity choice, we're going to take the derivative of expected utility with respect to Q. And after we substitute the budget constraint, this in here. Okay, so we've got expectation of this budget constraint, and we've got the variance of this budget constraint. Simple partial derivative says, when we take the derivative with respect to Q, we get the expected profit minus PR. So that's the expected you know, net profit per share, net of the, the opportunity cost of buying the asset. We get a piece that reflects your effect on prices, right? This is the market power piece. When I buy an extra share of the risky asset, how much do I affect the price P? And that's multiplied times R and the quantity you buy QI. Every share you buy has an effect on the price. And then you get the risk term, minus two times your risk aversion parameter over two times the quantity times the conditional variance. This is, I'm unhappy if there's more risk. Okay, that makes this a, an additional share have lower expected utility because I'm bearing more risk. Okay. So we solve this out for, we set this equal to zero. We solve that for Q and we get an expression that actually looks a lot like what we looked at in the first section. The optimal Q before we were talking about firms, numbers of units produced in a Cournot model. Now we're talking about an investor's number of assets demanded, risky asset demanded, depends on the expected profit per share. That's the expected tomorrow's price plus dividend minus today's price and the riskless rate and a term that depends on risk preferences and risk, and this DPDQ term. So risk and market power divide, they moderate how much you respond to expected profits when you choose your portfolio. I just want to point out that this piece RDPDQI is often what's referred to as Kyle's Lambda. Okay, how much does a unit of, of Q chosen end up affecting the price? So also notice that both market power, this piece, and more risk result in less aggressive trades, right? I'm going to divide this by a bigger number. I'm going to bring it closer to zero. So I'm going to trade less aggressively on expected profits or losses. It's going to moderate those things and their substitutes, risk and market power enter additively. Data lowers this risk. So we'll see some results where market, how much market power there is affects the value of data because risk and market power are substitutes in the first order condition. Be, having more market power, having a higher DPDQ has the same effect. It mimics having more risk, more conditional variance or lowering conditional variance with data looks a lot like lowering DPDQ. Okay, so the unique price here is linear. That's proven in Kyle 89. We've got a price that depends on a constant signals and the noise, we've got price information, um, the uh, signal that you get from price, uh, I'm not sure what that bracket is doing there, but DPDY is the sum of all the BIs, the weights on all the signals. Since all the signals are the information, remember that's the innovation in the dividend process, that's the thing we're trying to learn about, how, what new information is there about the value of this firm, plus noise, okay? So these, that's information is embedded in this signal, that's the price information. So we'll get a price signal. We'll extract some information from prices. Remember, this is a noisy rational expectations model, meaning it's as if you see prices when you form demand, but your demands are optimal given the prices. Prices. You can think of this as I'm going to submit a limit order, and I'm going to say if this is the market clearing price, here's what my demand would be. And when I say if this is the market clearing price, I ask myself, well, if that actually turns out to be the market clearing price, what would I learn from that? What information should I extract from that? And you do that at every price and you send this demand curve to your, you know, to, to the market and the, mar the market maker clears that market. So you're, it's, you can think of this as conditioning on prices. 
Okay, so then we get a price signal. That's the price minus the known pieces of price. You know your signal and you know the constant and you divide it by the sum of all the BIs and you get out a piece that's a weight on signals on everybody else's signal and it's got some noise in there. It's got some price noise. Okay, so there's average signal noise and there's uh, the, the average signal noise and there's noise traders. They're both embedded in there. We still don't need noise traders to make prices noisy because the signal might have some aggregate noise in it. Okay, so that's just a little bit of the mechanics. How do you solve for a portfolio choice problem with price impact, with market power? And that's the same solution process, by the way, that step-by-step -step, as if we were solving the Cournot model from the previous problem. The only thing different was in the previous problem, when I was thinking about firms, I didn't let them condition on price and learn from prices when they decided how much to produce. Because I thought you can't really ever you know, a firm can't say, well, if the price turns out to be $7.99, I'll produce 56 shirts. You kind of got to produce the 56 shirts and then figure out what the price will be. So I, I structure those two problems slightly differently and whether I allow learning from prices. Okay, so this was our market clearing condition. We've got to figure out what is DPDQ. How do you do that? Well, let's consider investor one, just as an arbitrary choice of investors. The market clearing condition we can rewrite as the supply one minus the noise trade is investor one's quantity plus the equilibrium choices of all the other investors investors two through n okay so investor one has some control over their q1 why do we want to pull that out of the sum of all the equilibrium choices because we want to ask what's dpdq1 so we have to be able to move q1 so we don't want the optimal Q1 in there. We want a Q1 variable so we can take that partial derivative. I'm going to define MI as being this term for each firm I so that this is just the sum of over all MIs times the expected profit. And then we're going to use Bayes' law. We'll take the derivative with respect. To, we're going to use Bayes' law to figure out this conditional variance. We'll take a derivative with respect to Q1 and we'll apply the implicit function theorem. And we'll get something like this and we'll be able to solve that dpdq1 is this function of the underlying parameters and price coefficients of this model okay so this is just kind of how do you solve out the market power piece these are just the steps to do it and you can see that there are two pieces in here there's a um piece that has to do with how sensitively does everybody else react to changes in prices right this is the this is the same as the denominator of the first order condition, the optimal Q first order condition. This is if prices change, how much does everybody else change their quantity? This is sort of like the price elasticity of demand. How sensitive is my demand to a change in price? Let me go back and just show you. It's right. Oops. Where did I put it? Here it is. Uh, here, this piece. This. So here's our optimal Q. If the price changes, how much of that changes my optimal Q? It depends on this multiplier. So if this object is large, including the inverse, not what's inside the inverse. So if what's inside the inverse is small, there's low variance and low market power. We have very high elasticity to price. We have very sensitive quantities that are very sensitive to price. That's a highly elastic market. Okay, so um, this piece is about price el demand elasticity of price, price elasticity of demand. And then there are two other pieces in here. This is about when I affect the price, how do I affect how others learn through the price? This sum of BIs came from the price signal. So when I decide to, to buy or sell some of an asset, I move the price and I affect the information that others extract from the price. So I'm jamming their signal. So we call this signal jamming. And this minus R is simply, if I buy, I push the price up a little bit. If I sell, I push the price down a little bit. That's a classic bid shading effect. This bid shading terminology comes from auction theory, but notice that this could also be an auction, right? This is the same model one uses with thinking about financial bids, could be thinking about bids for a, um, a divisible good auction. So when I think about price impact, there are two pieces. How do I muck up the price as people learn from it? And how do I just move the price up or down in levels with, with, my, with my demand? Okay, so Kasper and Sundaresan show that when Kyle's lambda increases, 
the marginal value of information decreases. Remember, Kyle's lambda is that DBD, DPDQ. How much does my, my choice affect the price? And that reduces the marginal value of information. How does an additional unit of signal precision affect my expected utility? And the intuition is pretty clear. If you can't take big bets on good data without adversely affecting the price, creating these price movements against you. So if your data says buy, but you start to buy and the price starts rising like crazy, you can't do a lot with that data. You can buy a little, but you can't really fully profit on it. If you're in a very liquid market with a high demand elasticity of price, and you start buying or selling a bit and other people trade against you without much movement in the price, you can get a lot more value out of your data. So illiquid markets, markets with lots of price impact, markets with low elasticity. I'm just saying the same thing in different ways. Those types of markets have much higher value for data than do the illiquid markets, the inelastic markets, the markets with lots of market power. And the math here is pretty simple. Remember, these two pieces were additive in the denominator of demand. So if DPDQ is large, let's say this second term is 100, and I've got some data that could reduce this conditional variance from 2 to 1. Well, 1 over 102 and 1 over 101 are just not very different numbers. Right? That doesn't change my first order condition, doesn't change my optimal action, therefore it doesn't change my expected utility by a heck of a lot. But if DPDQ is small, let's say DPDQ is 1, and I have some data that reduces conditional variance from 2 to 1, well, then this denominator is going from 3 to 2, 1 over 3, 1 third, and 1 half are quite different. That affects my optimal choice of portfolio by a lot and will it change my expected utility by a lot. So you can sort of see the, the intuition for that just from understanding that risk and market power are substitutes. So from this model, we can get some sufficient statistics to value information. So the value of information is the expected utility with the information minus the expected utility without the information. And I want you to keep in mind when we talk about expected utility, we're including equilibrium effects, we're including what everybody learns from prices, we're including the fact that other people may have other data that may be correlated with yours or maybe may see exactly what you see. All of that's possible here, right? That's all built in as variants of this model. The ut expected utility depends on something that looks like a squared sharp ratio. This is an expected return squared. We got a pre-multiply and post-multiply because these are vectors. And this is a matrix, but it's still an expected return divided by a variance, right? That's an expected return divided by a standard deviation squared. And this piece is a variance reduction. This is an unconditional variance of returns. This is like how much does that return move up and down in the time series. And this is a conditional variance of return. That's given everything that I know, how accurately can I forecast returns? Well, if I don't know anything, if I have no useful data, the forecast errors I make are the same as the volatility. I would just forecast the unconditional mean and all the variance would be my forecast errors. But if I've got some data, I can forecast this return and I can shrink my forecast errors, right? I can shrink the residuals from my regression if I've got a better data set to predict a Y variable with. Okay, so the difference between these two is the variance reduction of data. So RT plus one is the returns for I's investable assets. V hat here is a return, but it's got actually a, an adjustment for price impact in there. And the paper goes through exactly what that adjustment is and how to do it. But then the dollar value of data is a certainty equivalent. It's an investor, it's an amount that makes an investor indifferent between having the data or having no data, but having some additional riskless wealth. And so what's that additional riskless wealth? That's what we call the value dollar of data. And that value dollar of data is one over the riskless rate times the risk absolute risk aversion, the local absolute risk aversion at that point, your utility function of the utility with data minus the utility without. So we can value data in that way. And what do we need to do to value that data? We need to estimate an expected return, estimate an unconditional variance, those are pretty straightforward. I know there's a lot of nuance in asset pricing, exactly how we should compute those means and variances, but the challenge is getting that conditional variance. So that's, I'll talk in a second about how to do that. Let me just say, this could be really surprising because I was just trying to convince you that the information that everybody knows is incredibly important for how you value data. 
But then I just showed you an expression where the information that everybody knows seems to have vanished. Well, it didn't vanish. It matters through returns. So if everybody else knows a piece of data, that data is impounded in prices. It affects PT. And if it's relevant data, it also affects tomorrow's price or dividend. Well, it affects tomorrow's price and dividend and PT, the numerator of the, of the fraction and the denominator of fraction, right? Returns are the payoff divided by the price. It affects both the numerator and the denominator. It doesn't affect the return. So if it doesn't affect the return, information that everybody knows doesn't forecast returns, it's just impounded in price and relevant for payoffs, then conditioning on it won't affect the conditional variance. So it won't increase uh, your expected utility and it won't have any value. So the fact that other people know it is crucial, but it's crucial because of the way that it affects the variance and mean of returns. So this is a return-based sufficient statistic and it's a sufficient statistic for a rich equilibrium model where there are lots of cross interactions and learning and information linkage through price and so forth. This is an essential step for this literature because it's if we, we know that if we go and try to quantify the underlying parameters, this thing doesn't function. It doesn't price assets really well. But if we can start like much of the empirical asset pricing literature does from measuring the means and variances of returns, then we can use the structure to make more quantitatively meaningful statements. Okay. Okay, so how do we estimate these conditional variances? We do it by doing OLS. So a little insight here is that for linear normal variables, Bayes law and OLS coincide. The conditional variance is the expected squared forecast, the expected squared residual from an OLS regression. Well, that's great because that means we can run OLS with returns as our dependent variable on what, whatever we already knew, that Z, and this data we want to value. And we can get some residuals. We can look at past histories of, you know, if I want to think about buying the IBIS earnings forecast data set, I look at the past history of IBIS and I said, in the past, how well did it forecast? given everything else I know, and how big would my forecast errors have been. And then I go back and I do the same exercise with only the other information that I already knew, not with the data I'm valuing. I form a conditional variance. I want to adjust for the degrees of freedom. I form a conditional variance by estimating the residuals, squaring them, and averaging them. And then I plug these in the ex equilibrium expected utility expression I showed you before, and we can value data. This is sort of what happens when we actually did this. We asked how much are this year's IBIS data forecasts worth to an investor who only knows dividend and the dividend price ratio, and we make it a take it or leave it author, offer. Either you can get IBIS in addition to these two things you already know, or you don't get any additional data, right? There's no external data market or other supply or so forth, and this is their willingness to pay. You see very, very different amounts. So the purple here shows you that richer investors value data much more than poorer ones. The yellow shows you that investment style matters enormously. If I only trade small assets, this stuff's worthless. It just doesn't forecast the, the returns to those kind of assets. But if I'm trading growth or large assets, I'm willing to pay a lot more for it. And price impact reduces the value of data a little bit if I'm poor, this is a slightly smaller number, you just don't see it in the significant digits, but it reduces it by a lot, 844,000 relative to 57,000 if I'm wealthy. So the more I value data, the more price impact reduces my value of data. And so the dispersion of valuations for the same data is, is enormous, but price impact is shrinking it. So in every case, this is a willingness to pay for exactly the same data points. And look how much those values vary from the millions over on the right to 0, 0.00 on the left. That tells you that data is a asset with a lot of private value. We typically think of financial assets as mostly having a common value, right? Alexa's valuation for a share of General Motors is might be high or low, but it's probably pretty similar to mine because it pays money and money is money and it's kind of worth money to everybody. This is an asset where what you're going to do with that data determines its value and little differences, like am I going to trade small assets or large assets, could have enormous consequences for my willingness to pay for the same data. Can you, can you yeah. learn us a little bit more about the differences across the columns? I can see with small stocks, there's probably a lot of price impact. Or, you know, but like, why, why pay so much more for growth and for value? Is it just the IBIS guys are better at predicting that? Is exactly. It turns else? out that the IBIS earnings forecasts are just terrible. 
they're just not very informative. There's probably also some, there could also be some illiquidity issues in here, but it's primarily, it just doesn't reduce the forecasting error by very much. Gotcha. And um, the other question I had is, how does it vary with risk aversion? You're, you're talking about wealth here, but for risk aversion, yeah. I thought it was interesting because like you said, on one hand, data is a substitute uh, for, for risk. So I might value that more if I'm more risk averse, but on the other hand, I'm going to trade less aggressively on it. So it just wasn't clear to me how that would come through. Okay. So wealth works through the absolute risk aversion. This is, mm -hmm. We actually did this in an example where people have constant relative risk aversion with relative risk aversion of two. And that mm -hmm. implies a mapping between your wealth and your absolute risk aversion. And so okay. this is showing up, you know, right uh, here through the value of data. So you're there's no independent risk of variation, risk aversion. It's the wealth is the sufficient statistic part. Is that that's, kind right. Of what that's okay. right? The wealth is the sufficient statistic for your absolute risk aversion here. And then this uh, idea of do you affect the price or not is the, the top panel versus the bottom panel. So the top panel is no price impact. That's perfect competition. We, we could think about somebody who's, you know, a hedge fund manager, the average size of US hedge fund is 250 million. You know, we could think of a world in which they have no price impact. It's probably not reality, right? And this is Joel Hasbrook's estimate of, you know, if you make yeah. a, you know, somebody, a large trader, an institutional trader makes an order, how much should they move the price, right? That's probably more relevant. You know, I guess the more, one thing you're highlighting is the more relevant rows are probably closer to perfect competition for the household with half a million dollars of wealth and closer to the price impact for this investor, the 250 in wealth. That we're breaking out the pure wealth effect and the price impact effect separately. Yeah. And okay. last question: the all column is always bigger than any of them, so it's not just the max. It, there's yeah. some covariances going on. There's the IBIS guys are particularly good at forecasting some mix of this. That kind of well, what's causing that? Because these guys are unconstrained, and an yeah. unconstrained investor who doesn't have to trade small assets, right. doesn't have to trade, is always going to make the best possible use of data. And that's not just the max of the four, it's it's no. some linear combination of them that turns out to be even better. Exactly, because the person who trades them all can, um, you know, is not just able to choose the best column, but they can also buy growth in some periods and value in others and small and large and so forth. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Cool. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of skip this about the, well, okay, let's do this quickly. Um, Inelastic asset demands create more elastic data demands. So an inelastic market demand means there's more price impact. Okay, if other people's demands aren't elastic, then when you buy and sell, you move the price by more. We saw that price impact lowers data values, but it lowers the most for investors with the highest data values, right? These guys who are really rich, their data values fell by a lot. And so they're the ones who wanted to use the data to trade really aggressively. Like those are exactly the people who are going to get hit by inelastic markets, by price impact. And so if the data values become less heterogeneous, they become more condensed, then if the price of data moves in that part of the market where there's a lot of very dense demand, you're going to get big changes in data demand, right? If there are a lot of people with demands really close to this region, and I move the price a little bit through this region, I'm picking up or losing a really dense set of customers. And that's a high price elasticity of data demand. And so inelastic asset demand, which made the val data valuations more compressed, creates more elastic data demand. And so that's an interesting connection between the price, the, the degree of competition and price elasticity and so forth of these two markets. All right. I think I'm not going to talk all the way through um, the details of this model, but I want to give you a sense that you could use this sort of setting, this kind of Kyle 89 price impact setting to think about data platforms. And this is based on work that I did. It's about treasury auctions. This is with Nina Boyarchenko and David Luca, but it's really also about how what we call a dealer is a data intermediary. So, um, the, the question that motivated us was that we saw dealers trading information. They were chatting about clients' order flows in chat rooms, which is potentially illegal, insanely stupid. Um, but there's an interesting economic question of who does it help or hurt? And so we wrote down a model where there was strategic bidding 
by dealers and large investors, that kind of strategic bidding. I mean, it had a DPDQ, right? That's what strategic trade is. It had a choice between you could use a dealer or you could bid directly. Dealers, what did they do? Well, they'd observe their client's order flow. If I can see the queue you're choosing, I can figure out something about what your signal probably was. And they'd share that information, maybe with other clients of the dealer, or maybe even they'd get in these chat rooms with other dealers and share it between dealers. We built that possibility into the model. They might collude. And we had, because it was a treasury auction, we had a dealer minimum bidding requirement. That's not that, that uh, relevant for this conversation. And we found that actually this information sharing by dealers increases treasury revenue because when more information gets shared, there's less risk, there's less uncertainty. Everybody can forecast better. When I can forecast better, I should bear less risk. This asset is less risky to me. I bid more aggressively, I bid more. So it pushed up the revenue of this market. It made the asset worth more. And whether investors were hurt or helped depended on who the dealers shared the information with. When they shared information with other investors, so basically a dealer takes all this order flow from all their investors, it creates a joint signal from seeing everybody's order flow. It says, here's what I think is going on with the, the you know, future value of this asset. And then it goes and calls the investors and says, hey guys, I see really strong demand. That actually happens, it's called adding market color. And they'll go back to their investors and say, hey, I see really strong demand going into this auction. Do you wanna revise your bid, right? So they're sharing information about other people's order flows. That turns out to be bad for the investors. But sharing between the dealers turns out to be good for investors. Okay, so that's a kind of counterintuitive result. I'll walk you through that one result. And then um, information sharing turns out to be a type of financial accelerator here because bad news is shared. It pushes down price, but good news is not shared. If I have a, a choice whether to go to the dealer or not, I wanna to go to the dealer when I've got news that says I probably won't buy that much anyway, but if I've got really great signal and I think I wanna go all in and buy a ton of this, I really don't want the dealer to know I'm gonna do that because I don't wanna have a big price impact. And so I don't share good news. I do share bad news. Everybody learns the bad news. We get much bigger price market falls than increases. Okay, so this looks just, this is a, uh, you know, N investors. There's an unknown future value of an asset. There are a finite number of investors who have price impacts and they get signals. So far that looks, there are different words on here, treasury security and so forth, but this is all exactly the same. And there's some noise traders. This is exactly the same as the model we just looked at. What's different is this information sharing part. The dealers see all the orders of the clients and they average that from seeing your order, I can impute what your signal must have been, right? I can take your first order condition and I know all the parameters of this economy. The only thing I don't know is what's your conditional expectation. I can back out what your signal was. And so the dealers take all the signals of their clients and they average them. And then they might share that with other dealers. That's a possibility. Sometimes we'll say that's zero and we'll shut down dealer sharing, but it's possible that these dealers will share those average signals with other dealers. And, or they might share them with their clients. So I might give my client, pick up the phone and give you some market color Market color means I'm going to take my conditional expectation of the payoff of that asset, conditional on all the information I've seen, all my client's order flow, and I'm going to add some noise to it. I'm not going to tell you everything that I know, but I'm going to give you a noisy version of what I know. I'm going to say, hey, demand looks a little strong today, right? That's not, here's exactly what I saw, but it's a noisy version of what I saw, and we're going to clear the market. But I just want to point out that this is a data platform, this idea that orders are routed through an intermediary who sees that order, who strips it of its data, who aggregates the data, right? Here's that aggregated data, it's the S bar, it's the average signal, and then potentially distributes it to others. Maybe it sells it to others. Maybe there's a quid pro quo. In this model, dealers gave clients, well, dealers would share with other dealers because they get information in return, right? I'll give you mine, you give me yours. There's some barter going on there. And they'd share with their clients because if they don't tell their clients anything, the clients won't bid through the dealer. The clients will go and bid directly into the auction, which they're allowed to do. Okay, so there's a barter trade going on here, but the barter trade is data for data. I give you my order flow data and you give me this signal about everybody else's order flow data 
Now we're both better informed. Okay, so there's a lot of information barter going on in here. Um, there's This gets tricky, and the reason it gets tricky is that information sharing does two things. It makes both of us better informed, but it also correlates our signal noise, right? If you see my signal and you're the intermediary, and then you give a version of the average signal to everybody, my signal noise is now in that signal you gave to everybody else. And so we've got a really messy, messy signal structure. And so it requires state-space filtering methods. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, what I want to tell you is I'm a set, when I say state-space filtering methods, this is essentially the same insight as I gave you before, that using Bayes' law with normal variables is doing OLS. So what you should do when you've got a really messy signal structure like this is run OLS. What does it mean to run OLS in a theory? The OLS, you know, we think of it as X prime X inverse X prime Y. What does X prime X inverse represent? That's the variance of our, of our signals, of our observable variable inverse. It's a variance. It's an, it's an approximation. It's a small, small sample approximation to an inverse variance. And what is the X prime Y? Well, that's the covariance of what you observe with the thing you're trying to forecast of your independent and your dependent variables. And so running OLS means constructing this variance and covariance in the model and using it to form a forecast. Okay, so this is the formulas you use to do that. But essentially, conceptually, what you're doing is you're running OLS where you know the true moments of the data because you wrote the model. And OLS doesn't ever say hey, those observable variables, those independent variables you have, they better not be correlated. There is no such assumption, no such restriction for OLS. This is a valid, this is the unbiased linear estimator. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of what's going on here. There's a very difficult signal extraction problem that you get around by using something like an OLS equation. Okay, so then the one result I want to tell you about is this idea that sharing with clients and sharing with dealers has different effects on utility. This is the one I want to show you. So clearing client information sharing reduces clients utility. Now don't get me wrong, every client would like for their dealer to pick up the phone and tell them everything that they know. That is always utility improving for the clients. But what's not utility improving for the clients is when the dealer picks up the phone and calls all of their clients and tells all of them what he knows. This is like a prisoner's dilemma. I'm better off if I get the information. You're better off if you get the information. But if we all collectively get the information, we're worse off. This is a version of what's called a Hirschleifer effect. And it happens because it makes our beliefs more dispersed. When the dealer shares his information with us and Alexei, let's say he's a dealer and he shares his information with his clients and Puneet, he's a dealer and he shares his information with his clients. Well, you've made all of our beliefs a little more precise. We're a little more sure of ourselves, but in different ways. And we end up speculating against each other and doing less efficient risk sharing. But when the dealers get together, when me and Alexei and Puneet, we get together and we pool our information with each other, we make the dealer's information more similar. And now when we share some of that information with our clients, we have less dispersion, we have less betting against each other, and we have more efficient risk sharing. So the point is that whether information, it's not that information sharing is always bad or good. The key is the way in which information sharing affects information asymmetry. Asymmetry here is bad. And sometimes sharing increases that asymmetry of beliefs and sometimes information sharing reduces the asymmetry of beliefs. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this and let's wrap up this part so we have time for the third piece. So data is one of the most valuable assets in the modern economy. We need tools to value it. It has, I've shown you in this piece, it has enormously variable private values. And that makes it kind of different from financial assets. The same data it was worth vastly different amounts from 0.00 to 1.2 million for the same data to different investors that simply had different wealth, different investment styles, different price impacts. And we talked about how you can put data platforms in this. That's an agent 
who sees the order flow of the agents in the market, who uses, collects, collates that information, and then maybe gives it, distributes it to other market participants. In this case, that was a pure information barter trade, but you could put a price on that information and think about buying or selling it. And the way you model that is just that simple structure I showed you where, you know, the Kyle 89 kind of structure, but it's changing the variance covariances of the signals. So let me repeat that. A data intermediary is simply a mechanism that changes the variance covariance structure of the signals that agents get in the economy. Okay, that's once you know that variance covariance matrix, you know everything you need to know about that data intermediary. So next steps here, you could estimate if you wanted to think about sort of this data valuation exercise, I told you how to evaluate data for one investor with particular characteristics, you could estimate distributions of investor characteristics and trace out a demand curve. And you could think about what's the data supply side, that's something I'll talk a little bit about in the third piece. Where does data come from? How is it produced? And then you could put those two together and you could come up with a theory of what's the equilibrium price for a piece of data. And then you've really done asset pricing theory, but for data, right? And that's a whole agenda of work that has yet to be done and we'd love to have more people participate in. Okay, so let me break here for my second piece. Let's take a shorter break this time, maybe five minutes. Sounds good. So 11.30, okay. we'll be back. 11.30, yep. And then we'll go through the last piece. Great. Thanks. Laura, there's one question in the chat, whether um, you have any additional resources you could uh, point people to. Um, we could save that for the end if you like. Um, so you mean like a textbook kind of thing? Um, it, it just says it would be lovely if you could name some resources for this wonderful lecture. I guess the slides, obviously. Um, right. Um, the slides, um, you know, some of this, especially the, the noisy rational expectations part I was just talking about, there's a, a textbook that I, I wrote, um, Information Choice in Macroeconomics and Finance, that goes through a lot of the mechanics. And, and I realized there's sort of a lot of implicit knowledge here. I didn't start with Bayes' Law for normal variables and, and all of that. And so that would really build up, um, you know, the set of tools that, that one might use to, to, you know, get to this point and, and be able to, to do this. Um, let's see, uh, you know, and then I guess the, the, you know, many of the papers that I've referenced, um, there, there might be a textbook in the near future covering this material, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, it doesn't exist, uh, as of yet. Um, but, but, uh, you know, do look for that and I don't know, it might, it might take a year or so. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. okay. Let's keep going. Great. Okay, so last part, we're getting to sort of the, the pinnacle. We've talked about, you know, the data economy. We've talked about how data is being used and, and traded in financial markets. And now we're going to think about valuing data as a new asset type. So we talked about data super valuable. Most valuable firms are valued largely for their data. We want to know things like data is this new asset class. Is it overvalued or undervalued? I don't really know. Do data intensive firms have valuations that are realistic, right? The first is kind of an asset pricing question for data as an asset. The second is a corporate finance question. We talked about some entrepreneurship related questions about, you know, is data creating market power and maybe entry barriers for new firms. But, you know, these kinds of, in particular, the valuation tools need updating for a modern data economy. So we'll think about a little about how to do that in our last half hour. So this has got to involve measuring the amount and value of firms data. And there's a supply side, right? We've talked about data as a byproduct of transactions, and we'll talk a little bit about the data value chain. Most of this is running through pieces that we've already seen from various parts of this, this class, um, but we'll pull them together. And then I'll talk about six approaches to measuring and valuing data. None is perfect. All of them are flawed in various ways, but all of them will allow us to make progress. And we'll talk about what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of each, and then conclude you know, where, where next. Um, so we've talked about this data feedback loop, more transactions generates more data, generates more quality and so forth. Um, and, you know, this is one of the ways you want to think about the supply side of data. When we talk about modeling out the supply side, where does it come from? This is an important piece of the story. And, you know, there's a question about whether it creates big monopolies. My work with Julianne Beganau and Mariam Farbudi explored that in the context of financial data. So this higher value piece was central. 
we talked about that just kind of summarizing pieces that we've talked about in various parts already. Data creates more value or efficiency for firms. It raises current profits because they might choose better products, inventory, transport, advertising, and so forth. It creates market power, right? And that's a source of value for a firm. We might not like it as a social planner or regulator, but it's good for firm profitability and it creates the, the possibility of entry barriers. And data is valuable because it reduces risk. Don't forget about that last part. So data is information. The role of information is to resolve uncertainty. It's not just making a firm more efficient. And that uncertainty piece, you don't want to forget about it just as a simple heuristic, how big might this be? Think about re financial returns. The equity premium is about twice as big as the riskless rate. That tells you that compensation for risk is right now about twice as large as the expected return that investors are getting for providing their capital. That means risk compensation is really big. It's at least of the order of magnitude of the stuff, the riskless sorts of effects that we talk about. And so if data affects that risk, it affects that uncertainty by a, a changing the way in which people can forecast that could potentially have really large effects on valuations. So one way we want to think about data being valued is what we talked about at the very beginning. Alexei asked me about, you know, should we distinguish between data and information? And we talked about raw data, structured data, and knowledge. And there's really a whole labor force involved in each one of these layers. So think of raw data as the transaction record. You know, I bought some shoes yesterday. They saw what I bought. Knowledge is how should the shoe company use that to maybe advertise to me in the future. It's an action recommendation. And part of this transformation is taking that, that record and making it part of a structured usable data set. And the people who do this have different skills. They're referred to as data managers. And I'm describing this because we're going to use them to try to measure data in a bit. And I'm going to call that kind of labor lambda. And we might think about structured data, capital D, as being generated with raw data, lowercase d, and data management labor. You put together data management workers and raw data, they make beautiful structured data sets for you. But then you need a different kind of worker. We'll call them an analyst and call that kind of labor L. We need structured data for the analysts to work with, and then they can create knowledge, right? And this is sort of that stock of knowledge that we were talking about before that really helps a firm act more efficiently. It's an action recommendation. So that's part of the story of the supply of data. It works its way up this data value chain. And then lastly, the piece of supply of data has to do with buying and selling. And we, we talked about data purchases and sales before, but I want to point out that there are two different ways that data might be sold. They're indirect and direct data sales. So just like financial information can be monetized through selling a data set directly or selling an analyst report that describes the risks a certain sector faces, you could also buy data indirectly through the services of a managed fund. Right? What should a managed fund be doing? They should be collecting and analyzing data and using it to manage your assets for you. Well, that's a data service, right? And Google does something similar. They could sell you data directly, names and zip codes of people who bought stuff, right? That's direct sale of structured data. But they could also use their data as a data service to place ads for you. You tell them, I want to put ads in front of people who buy red shirts. Well, that's a data service. It's an indirect sale of their information and it's selling kind of the knowledge, the action part of the recommendation. Okay, so both of these are important. There's a literature, uh, Edmadi and Fleider come to mind, a paper in the 1980s that thought about this in the context of financial information and exactly the same parallel is going on with data services today. Okay, so that's a piece of the supply side. And then the other piece is this data is imperfectly non-rival. And we talked about this before. You can sell data, you can keep part of it, and this means that there's something that looks like a negative bid-ask spread when it comes to data markets. Okay, so now we're going to use these ideas about where data has come from to try to measure and value data. I'm going to go through six approaches to measuring cost accounting, complementary inputs, value functions, revenue, choice covariance, and an intangibles approach. So the cost approach, this is the most traditional. This is like a book value approach to valuing assets, right? How would you construct the book value of, you know, the, the office building that you work in? Well, it would accumulate the sum of costly investments. It would add up all the costs of building the building. Might 
compare it to other comparable buildings, but, but you can think about doing something like that with data costs, right? If you bought the data set, that's its value, and we're gonna add up the value of all the data sets you bought. The problem is lots of data is a byproduct of some other economic transaction. So, you know, if Amazon got data because I bought this green shirt from them, um, what was the cost of producing that data? Well, they didn't really produce it, it was a byproduct. So there wasn't an explicit cost. So the cost approach is gonna kind of fall apart here, except that remember we had this discussion right at the beginning that maybe customers are kind of paid for their data. Maybe I paid a little bit less for this green shirt than I would have otherwise because the seller wanted to generate lots of transactions to build up a data set of people who like green shirts. Well, that means that data is being partly bartered or the goods and services are being partly bartered for data and partly for monetary payment. So that shows up as a discount in the price of the good. If we could price that discount, then we could use that price as an implicit cost of data that the firm paid to get it, right? If we knew that I paid 19 cents less for the shirt because the firm really wanted that transaction to get my data, that would be the price of that data and we could add up that data value. So that's a difficult thing to do. Nobody's done it, but that's a possibility. The data approach, cost approach as it stands, let's just add up the monetary prices of, of data, may work well if most of a firm's data sets are purchased. There are some instances of firms that don't generate much of their data that purchase most of the relevant data. Even then though, there's this issue, remember data has this large private value component. So there's a question of what do we mean by data value? Do we mean value to the firm that purchased it? Do we mean equilibrium transactions price? Do we mean value to the seller? Do we mean value to an average participant in this market? But in any case, keep in mind that a transactions price might not be equal to a private valuation, because as we saw, the valuation for the same piece of data could vary wildly from you know, zero to 1.2 million. Okay, approach number two. We could think of complementary inputs. So knowledge is produced using structured data and analyst labor, right? That's that information pyramid I showed you before. So I'm just putting an equation on that. Knowledge might be produced using data, analyst labor. I'll give each of these a exponent between zero and one. They're both essential. We're not gonna get any knowledge without people. We won't get any knowledge without any information for the people to work with. I'm gonna put in here a time specific productivity term and a firm specific productivity term. Maybe some firms are just better run. Then a new structured data is added to the existing stock of structured data. So we're talking about where this D comes from and data managers do that. And then this data depreciates at a rate delta. Okay, remember we talked about this delta might not be a linear depreciation rate, but here we'll keep things simple and just think about a linear rate. So tomorrow's data is depreciated today's data plus the inputs of the data management workers. Okay, well, we can take these two production functions, we can observe hiring. We can see for a given firm, how many analysts are they hiring? How many data management workers are they hiring? Right, we're gonna take job postings, do textual analysis on this, and we can figure out what wages they're paying them. We get that data from Payscale. This is a project I do with Simona Abbes. And then we ask what amount of data, what DIT, would make employing this many analysts, this many data managers, and paying them these wages optimal. So basically we're structurally estimating these with a panel of firms and hiring data to try to back out their Ds. So we do this, the, the idea here is that labor is complementary to data. So seeing evidence of hiring tells us something about what data the firm would have. There's another complementary input that's very natural for data, which is IT capital. And so Brezhnehan and Brynjolfsson do an exercise where they use IT capital investments to proxy for the amount of data. Okay, so this complementary input approach, there could be multiple complementary inputs. We used labor. Labor is kind of nice because it, it's kind of difficult to hire somebody without publicly posting something. And so it leaves this sort of trail of evidence about the amount of data firms have, which is never publicly disclosed. So when we estimate this thing, what we were particularly interested in is what are these exponents for firms that hire AI skilled or machine learning skilled analysts who can use data with this new technology and ones that use old technologies. So what we found was that those exponents are substantially different 
for firms that use AI enabled uh, skilled workers and ones who don't. And in particular, the fact that this AI exponent is much higher than the old technology exponent means that AI has significantly raised the productivity of analyzing larger data sets. And it means that data in the hands of AI enabled workers is much more valuable. We learned that data has lower diminishing returns because a given worker can work with lots more data. That's kind of not surprising. They're big data technologies, right? They were designed to work well with lots and lots of data. But the implication of that, that data has less diminishing returns, is that the labor has more diminishing returns. I don't need as many workers to work with a given big data set because I've got this great new big data technology. And we find that the labor share for our middle level of data depreciation fell from 18% to 13% in the sector. This is a pretty low labor share in the financial sector, but that's kind of this, the sector is sort of an exception. It's an outlier in that way. And that's a, that's a decline of 5%. That's kind of a big deal potentially for income inequality, that technologies that are like the industrialization of knowledge production, right? Think about what industrialization did in the early part of the a late part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, they made capital a more important input into production. Before we had lots of production that was artisanal, it had labor as a really large component of production and some simple tools. Industrialization comes along and it makes physical capital a much more important component of the production, fewer workers per machine, and we're changing the labor and capital share. New data technologies are changing the labor data share in similar ways. So this technological change from a labor share of 18% to 13% is a big change. It's in the realm of what people estimate as the change in labor capital share in the Industrial Revolution. So historians estimate that change somewhere between 5% and 20%. Our estimate is at the lower end of the size of estimates for the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so we could think about complementary inputs. We could think about the costs. We could also use a value function approach. Remember, we, we'd written down a Bellman equation before. In the first part, I showed you how a firm might value its data set by maximizing. It could choose capital and labor, and it's got some quality that depends on data, and it's got to pay its workers and pay its capital, and it's got a continuation value for data tomorrow. We could use this. That's kind of like what macro does to think about what's the value of capital. It writes down a Bellman equation, and then it calibrates or structurally estimates this kind of equation. Now we need to pair that with a theory of data inflows, right? How do we update the state variable from data t to data t plus one? And that theory of data might inflows might include byproduct of transactions. It might tell you that data t plus one is data t plus something that depends on how many units I produce. We might include data purchases or sales. We might say that tomorrow's data is today's data plus all the data that I buy or minus a fraction of what I sold. Or we could put something in the state evolution equation that captures the idea that you hire labor to process raw data in order to generate more structured data in your data set. Or that maybe you need analysts to turn data into what this really is, is maybe knowledge, right? And so there are different ways you can think about how does the stock of data evolve using the tools I've already given you? But once you pair this with a theory of data inflows and you have a law of motion for data depreciation, remember we learned that Bayes' law tells you data depreciates in a way that depends on the persistence of the state you're learning, you're forecasting, and the variance of its innovations. And we have one of these, or maybe all of these, we could, we could combine these together. We have some theory about new data inflows. We have a law of motion for the state. Okay, so you could take that and you could estimate it. So what Simona and I did actually is we used approach two in conjunction with approach three. We looked at the hiring of workers that are complementary to data, and we thought about firms that were accumulating data using a recursive Bellman approach. And when we did that, we could estimate the value of data for each of these firms and the cumulative value over time from, my, from 2015 to 2019 is what we plot here. So this is in hundreds of billions of current US dollars, and we find that the value of data has grown by more than 30% over these three years. And that's an enormous rate of growth. Data value is growing for three different reasons, and the model lets us pull them apart and see how much. They're, they're approximately a third, a third, a third. First is 
firms are just accumulating more and more data. They're hiring more data managers and they're adding more to their stock of structured data. Second, they're more analysis workers they're hiring. You might think that with more data and a lower labor share that data would replace workers, but it's not. The sector is becoming much more efficient. So even though we have fewer workers per unit of data, this sector is becoming more efficient and it's growing the, the stock of data very rapidly to the point where they're also growing the number of analyst workers they're hiring. And more analyst workers make each data point more valuable, right? If you have more workers with a machine, you have a higher marginal productivity of capital. If you have more workers with the data, point of data, you have a higher marginal productivity of data. So more analysis workers is increasing the value that firms extract from their data stock. And third, they're just becoming more productive. The time trend and productivity, particularly for the firms that hire workers that have AI and machine learning skills, there's a rapid rate of growth of productivity. And so all three of those things are growing the value of data for financial analysis firms. Okay, so another approach. We were looking at, that was using complementary inputs and a recursive problem. We could look at the revenue, right? In that case, we didn't know, we couldn't see the revenue of these firms, but maybe you had a clear view of what firms were using for data and you could calculate the present discounted value of the revenue generated by that data. Now, this is tricky. The tricky piece here is how do you isolate data revenue from other sources of revenue? And it's tricky because if you try to extrapolate one of the things we saw, remember that convexity of a young firm entering in a market where there are other firms already in existence and they had this really slow rate of growth there in that version of the model, they were actually losing money early on. They were producing really low quality goods for the purpose of generating transactions and more data, but they were losing money on those transactions. And a lot of digital firms are losing a lot of money early on. Now, if you see a firm that's losing money and you say, well, I want to value it with a revenue approach, let me extrapolate its revenues out 10 years and put a terminal value on it, you'll get a negative valuation. So you want to be really careful about thinking about revenue and modeling it. You're going to need a clear idea of how data generates revenue and a model is going to be essential because firms are, are you don't want to just extrapolate. Firms are going to use different profit from data in different ways throughout different parts of their lifespan. That's that what that whole short term part of that early that model we looked at in the first in the first segment looked at said taught, taught us. And so model is really essential. What you want to do is you want to compute counterfactuals with more or less debt, uh, revenue. But an example of that revenue approach was the sufficient statistics approach. The, the, uh, the, the one that I did with Mariam Farbudi and Dhruv Singhal and Venki Venkateshran, where I showed you in the first half of our second segment, um, how to take a portfolio choice problem and put a price on data. That's a revenue approach, right? That was asking how much can they earn in a risk adjusted basis from using this data to generate additional revenue. Fifth approach choice covariance. So when we talked about firms using data, remember I said that data increases the covariance of their production and their consumer demand that they were trying to, to forecast. In a portfolio choice problem, in a financial context, data allows an investor to increase the covariance of their holdings of a risky asset with their realized returns. If I can forecast returns, I buy more of the asset that end up having high returns. I increase covariance. In every one of these cases where data is used for forecasting, agents want to use the data to make better choices. They might make, you could think of this as achieving better matching or getting better signals. But better choices means they're going to take actions that co-vary with something that is payoff relevant and they're going to care about the product. So the expectation of the quantity times the return, whether that's on producing goods you sell or putting bids into an auction or buying shares of equity or, you know, how many, whether to produce red shirts or green shirts, I want to make choices that co-vary with the returns on those choices. And the expectation of the product is the product of the expectations and a covariance term. So agents the estimating data by looking at covariances, by looking at how systematically do you buy assets before they appreciate, or you know how much does this firm 
tweak its product mix in return to future consumer in, in co-varying with future consumer demand tells us something about what they know. And it's a nice measure because you cannot achieve a high covariance without information. Right? Everybody would like to have a covariance, high covariance between their choices and the returns that they offer. That'd be great. How do you achieve that? You have to be able to forecast the returns. It's not a measurable strategy. It's not a feasible strategy in an information theoretic sense to choose a quantity that co-varies with a, a, a random variable, some kind of payoff variable, unless you know something about that random variable. You have to have sufficient information to make that covariance possible. You could get lucky and get a high covariance in a small sample, but you can't systematically covary with that information. So you could go about measuring the covariance, right? And that's like measuring portfolio alphas. We talked about measuring firm versus product markups as a way of getting at that covariance. You could be measuring customer click conversion rates, right? What, to what extent does your ad placement co-vary with customer clicks? All of those would tell us something about how much do you know about that payoff relevant variable that you're trying to forecast. So if you can see actions and you can see payoffs, you could go estimate this covariance and get a sense of what does this firm know. And last approach is an intangibles approach. So a typical intangible valuation exercise would use something like book to market or really market to book, right? What is the equity valuation for a firm relative to its book valuation? Because the book valuation doesn't usually have intangible assets in it. It misses lots of these. Sometimes they show up if a firm bought a patent or if they purchased a data set, it might be listed as an asset, but lots of intangibles and lots of data assets. If you generated data as a byproduct of your economic activity, accounting rules do not allow you to list it in your value of your assets. So, but the market might recognize that this is a valuable asset and value your firm accordingly. So this is sort of like what Cruze and Eberly do or Peters and Taylor do um, for thinking about other kinds of intangibles. Maybe you could do something like that with data. Well, keep in mind that intangibles include lots of kinds of assets, branding, patents, organizational capital, customer capital. So people like Bello, Gala, Salomao, Vitorino, Eisfeld, Papa Nicolau, they try to measure these various forms of intangible capital and data might contribute to each of these. It probably helps you achieve better advertising and branding, it probably helps you organize your firm and manage it better and achieve a better degree of organizational capital, but it's not the same as any of one of these things. And it's pretty hard to tease data out from these other intangibles. We're going to need some additional information. So thinking about market to book might be informative about the data a firm has, but it probably not telling us everything. And it's not really distinguishing data from other features, other types of intangible capital and in pinpointing the data. It also presumes that equity market participants know how to value the data, right? The presumption here is if we're going to look at market to book to get all the value of the assets not in the book, that all the equity traders know exactly how to value the data. You know, if I don't know how to value data, I got some ideas here, but none of them are perfect. And guys of Wall Street are asking me to come tell them how to value data. I infer that they don't have a perfect solution to this either. So, you know, there's some information to be garnered from this, but we're going to need some fixes to make this work. And it's always going to be subject to the caveat that the market might not get it exactly right because this is a new kind of asset and new assets are often mispriced. All right, that's it. That's our six ways of measuring. We talked about how data is one of the most important, highly valued assets in the economy. It's also one of the hardest to observe. It's one of the hardest to measure. It's one of the hardest to put a price on, but it really changes the economics of what's going on in markets, right? We saw a growth economy that had similar long run predictions, but very different short run. There's this barter going on that's kind of different from anything else that we've seen in other parts of economics and could be really relevant for how we measure GDP and value added and the value of firms and the value of data sets and so forth. We're going to need a lot of different measurement approaches. When you do these, don't forget about risk. Don't forget the data doesn't just increase expected profits but it also helps to resolve uncertainty. And that risk component could be a really big part of its value. Remember equity premium are compensation for risk and they're big. So resolving risk could be a big deal. Theory and measurement definitely need to work together here, right? Just going out and saying, let's you know measure the markup or let's just take market to book or there are no simple solutions here. We're gonna need 
ideas and, and, and empirical evidence to function together. Lots of next steps here. If you think about something related to this and you say, why didn't she do it that way? Chances are it hasn't been done. And there are a lot of directions that could generate value, right? We could explore the supply side and the platforms and do much richer job of thinking about data markets. We could demand estimates. We could think of the IO of data markets of pricing and competition and entry and how many platforms should there be or how many data providers should there be. There are tons of important questions for us to, to tackle that are important to you know, finance professionals, that are important to regulators. Um, and we need lots more people working in this to make this, this area a success. This is not a talk or a class about a culmination of a research agenda. This is really a class about the beginnings of a research agenda that are you know, wide open with possibility. That's it. We do have uh, one quick question in the, in the chat. Yeah. Carl, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, sure. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Sure. Um, I, I was I was wondering, like, uh, up to what extent uh, firms uh, like Amazon can be willing to reduce the prices of the goods to acquire, um, you know, the the data of the transaction? If these, you know, because Amazon is selling a lot of goods, uh, and if they are lowering the price of all those goods, can this create some, I don't know, uh, deflation or something like that? Mm -hmm. And and also. If I reduce the price of the good that I'm selling, uh, the, dat the data that I acquire has the same quality as if I don't do it. Like I, I, what I'm saying is, suppose I'm selling a, a bottle for ten dollars. Um, I'm interested in seeing if the customer wants to buy that bottle at that price. Uh, um, but if I introduce, you know, uh, if I lower the price, I can maybe distort his intention or, you know, act somehow. And this can maybe uh, make the data that I'm acquiring, uh, you know, lower the quality of the data, maybe, of the transaction. Great, Could great questions. I love, I love where you're going with this. Um, so, you know, how much does Amazon lower the price? I really don't know. My guess is Amazon probably does very, very little, partly because they've got such enormous data sets. And remember, data has diminishing returns. So, you know, with so many transactions and such a large data set, the, the willing, the, their price concession to me to get my data point might be pretty low. But then maybe aggregated over lots and lots of transactions, maybe there's a significant amount of value there. A newer firm that's trying to sell directly to customers might do a lot more. Sometimes people give products away for free, right? To get the product reviews and get information out there. And, you know, so that's a pretty extreme case of, of price concessions. Probably for Amazon, um, this, is, this is pretty small um, per, per unit. Um, you know, this does suggest that we may be, we may be mismeasuring. Um, you had a second part of your question. I thought it was interesting, and now I've forgotten it as I answered your yeah, question. About yeah, about the, oh yeah, how, how trying to get that data, if I could just restate it for a minute, okay. trying to get that data, you might get different customers and the yeah. data might be less useful. Right, right, right. Sorry. So there's, there's a whole bunch of experimentation going on at firms like Amazon, where they try offering different people different deals and try to trace out a demand curve. Um, you know, I, do concessions affect that? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, there is some micro literature on that sort of experimentation, and you could go take a look at, at that and think more about what's the interaction between sort of data barter and and active experimentation and pricing to try to learn about consumer demand. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Great. I think we're out of time, but please join me in thanking Laura for a great talk. This is super interesting and just a big topic going forward, um, a, a, as Laura said. So I uh, really appreciate it. And Thank you all for coming to the MFS Summer School this year. Um, it's our last day and uh, we hope you enjoyed it. All the videos will be online, YouTube as well as Facebook. And uh, we hope to see you um, in, in coming years. Thank you all. Thanks everybody for sticking with us to the end. Be well. Bye.